Hello, in this video we're going to talk a little bit about what Java actually is. So Java is a powerful general purpose programming language. It's very widely used. It's been around quite a long time now and it will be around for a long time into the future. So it's a really great language to learn as your first programming language or as your only programming language because people certainly do make careers entirely out of Java. And whatever kind of program you want to write, there's a good chance that you can write it in Java. Uh, just for fun, I googled something like programs written in Java and I found this Reddit page. What are some of the biggest and well-known, well-known, well-known Java applications used in this in the world? And you can see just from me scrolling through this that there are an awful lot of things written in Java, and it covers an awful lot of different areas. Uh, so what is a programming language in general? Well, basically, programming languages can be div divided into two types, interpreted and compiled. Uh, in both cases, you write text files in your programming language. So Java is a language, in a way, in the, in the same sort of way that English or Greek or Italian are languages. Um, that is, you can write down Java, you can write down text in the Java programming language in any kind of text editor. You know, it's just some text. Then to get that to run on your computer, you need some other step has to happen in order to actually run that text as a computer program. So with interpreted programming languages, uh, what happens is your text gets fed to a thing called an interpreter, which is just a computer program. And that actually does whatever the text tells it to do. Now, Java is not interpreted. It's a compiled programming language. That means that we take our text and we use some software to turn it into an actual binary computer program, which can then run and actually do things on your computer. So quite often in this course, I might mention compiling or building. Compiling means taking your Java text and turning it into binary files, which are actual computer programs that your computer can understand. Building means uh, taking all the different binary files that you've created and building them or combining them into a single computer program. So um, I, I might I tend to use these terms a little bit interchangeably, compiling and building, although they do mean different things. Don't worry about memorizing this at the moment. All I'm trying to do is uh, reduce your confusion, not increase it. So I just want to run some of these ideas past you so that you've got a bit of an idea about what's going on here. So basically, we, we write Java programs as some text and we compile them and build them into a program. And usually that's more or less as simple as clicking a button after we've written the actual text. Most of what we're doing is just going to be writing that text in the Java programming language. If you want to create a particular type of program with Java, so let's say you want to create Android programs or you want to create uh, websites or web applications or um, games maybe even, you can create games in Java. Uh, whatever you want to do, first you would have to learn basically the Java programming language and then later on, you could learn how to use Java to do the particular type of thing that you want to do. So if you wanted to create websites, first you've got to learn Java, and then you'd have to learn about creating websites with Java. There may be other things that you have to learn. So in the case of websites, you'd have to learn more about web programming generally. But basically, that's the idea. This course teaches you the Java programming language, uh, so we'll be creating mostly text mode programs, which might not sound very exciting, but the thing is you'll be learning the Java language itself, and that will give you a very, very powerful sort of platform from which to then go and learn particular areas of Java that may interest you. Um, many people build careers just entirely out of Java. So uh, beginners often think that they've got to learn 15 different programming lang languages, but you really don't. Uh, lots of people just know basically one programming language, like a, like Java or C++ or something, and they just stick to that programming language and they build a whole career out of it. So although 
Um, in this course, I'm not going to teach you how to create Android apps or desktop apps. We may touch on some specific things you can do with Java, and I may show you some basic little examples to get you start started. But we're not actually going to be um, looking at any particular speciality. We are going to be looking at the Java programming language itself, writing text mode or console mode programs, we call them. But even so, you, you're going to be learning a very, very valuable skill here. And it's hopefully going to set you on a whole journey and enable you to do whatever you want to do with computer programming. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about how Java works. And once again, uh, don't stress, there's no need to really memorize this, but you'll, you will gradually become familiar with these ideas, I think, as you continue to use Java. So um, I've already said that Java is a compiled programming language. We take text files written in the Java language, we turn them into binary files, and that's called compilation. We combine them together if there's multiple files, this is called building, and then uh, we run them on a computer as a computer program. Uh, but actually, uh, it's a little bit even more interesting than that because Java does something rather interesting that many programming languages don't exactly do. And that is, there's this thing called the Java Runtime Environment, or JRE. And what this does is, is it's some software that creates effectively kind of like a simulated computer on your computer. And your Java program runs on that simulated computer. Now I'm simplifying a bit. Um, various optimizations mean that Java doesn't precisely run like that. Bits of Java code um, run kind of almost directly on your computer. But basically, uh, to simplify a bit, it's as though your Java programs are running on a simulated virtual computer, which runs on your computer. And that simulated computer is created by the JRE, the Java Runtime Environment. Now, the advantage of this is that Java is a compile-once, run-anywhere programming language. So with some computer languages like C++, you compile your, your source code, the code that you've actually written, and then um, it will only run on one particular type of computer. If you want to run it on a different type of computer, you have to recompile it, and maybe you even have to change it a bit to run on a different type of computer. The idea behind Java is that you compile it once, and that will run on any kind of computer that's running a Java runtime environment. So the Java runtime environment gives the Java program a kind of consistent environment to run in, regardless of the underlying type of computer. So this is a very clever idea. So if you want to run a Java computer, a Java program on your computer, then you need to have a JRE installed. We won't need to specifically install this because later on, we're going to install a Java development kit. The Java development kit includes a JRE, a Java runtime environment, so you can run programs once, it's, once this is installed but also it, it allows you to develop Java programs yourself. And all of these things are free, completely free. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to move on to, be, to install a Java development kit, among other things, because we'll also need uh, something to write our Java code in. Okay, uh, that's it for this video. Until next time, happy coding. Hello. To get started with pr writing Java programs, you're going to need two things. You're going to need um, the Java software that actually creates your programs, and you're going to need some sort of editor to work in. So in this video, we're going to take a look at installing the software that actually will take the text files that you're going to write in the Java programming language and turn them into actual Java programs. And what you need is the Java Standard Edition, that's SE, uh, Software Development Kit, SDK. So I'm going to search for Java SE SDK Download. In this course, we're using 
uh, version 11 of the development kit, at least to start with. So if I click on this link here that says Java SE Development Kit 11, then we go to the Oracle Downloads page. On this page, um, you have to be sure to check accept license agreement and then you need to download the correct installer for your platform. So I'm actually using Mac, so I, I would download this OSX uh, version. Um, I'd use the 64-bit version. So if you're using Windows, download the windows.exe installer and you've got options for Linux as well. So you need to download that and install it. You probably won't encounter any problems as long as you have admin rights on your computer. If you do encounter any strange error message, messages or anything like that, don't be afraid to type the error message out uh, into Google or into some search engine. Uh, just Google the error message, basically, and find out what comes up, um, because other people will have had the same problems. But basically, you shouldn't you shouldn't really encounter any problems most of the time. Uh, so you just need to install um, the latest version of Java. If there's a later version out by the time you're watching this, so um, version 12 is actually already out. And the reason I'm not planning to start off using that is because there are relatively minor changes in version 12 of Java compared to version 11. Uh, and um, it's not always the case that all the software you use will be compatible with the absolute latest version. So it's often not a bad idea to hang back a little bit from upgrading your version of Java because otherwise you may run into incompatibility issues. So I'm following the policy here in this course of using a fairly recent version at the actual time that I'm making this video. So if you're watching this and version 14 is out or whatever, you can use version 14. But I'm going to stick with Java 11 at the moment, even though version 12 is already out. Okay, so try to install that, get that installed, and I'll see you in the next video. Hello, in this video we're going to look at while loops in Java. So looping is where we really start to leverage the power of programming to change what would otherwise be extremely repetitive or even impossibly repetitive tasks into something we can just get the computer to do automatically. So uh, what I'll do here, since I'm using Eclipse and since I don't want to see all these projects, um, I've created a new project called while loops for this video. I'm just going to click this little down arrow by the Package Explorer, go to um, Select Working Set. I'm going to select Projects 2, which doesn't have any projects in it at the moment. This is what I created uh, in the last video. Click Edit, and um, I'm going to say that I want while loops in this working set. Click Add for that, click Finish and I just want to see the Projects 2 working set. So I click OK. And there we go, that's cleared things up a lot. OK, so um, I've got a blank project here and I'm going to output some text. So sysout, control space and hello. And let's run this project. So it just says hello, nothing spectacular there. Now. A while loop looks like this. So I use a Java keyword, a reserved word. So it's a special word in the Java language. And there aren't all that many uh, reserved words in the Java language, but this is one of them. And we can already see some others, for example, public and class and package. So let's type while. And next we've got two round brackets like this. And then we've got an opening curly bracket on the same line. Uh, it's on the same line because because of the code formatting convention that I'm using. You could be using a different one, but I wouldn't recommend it. And then we hit return, and Eclipse has actually put in the closing curly bracket for me. Now, what, what what's this going to do? Well, we're going to put stuff between these curly brackets. So in this code block, between these two curly brackets, we're going to put statements that we want to run repeatedly over and over again. 
and we have to have some way of saying how many times we're going to run them repeatedly. And in this case, what I'm going to do is something that you, uh, you don't usually do in a computer program, but we're just learning here, so it's fine. I'm going to make it run forever, or rather, until we stop the program. And to do that, I'm going to say while, and in the, in the round brackets, I'm going to put true. What's true? Well, it's... Um, that's a good question. You know what, we'll, we'll tackle that in a future video. But uh, we have a, a primitive type in Java called Boolean, and it can take the values true and false. So like an integer can take the values, can take whole number values. Boolean, the Boolean type, Boolean types of variables can take these values true or false, just one of these two values. And here we're using true. So that's saying while true is true, in other words, keep looping. And the value true is always true, so it will loop forever. Don't worry too much about this. If this sounds baffling, I'm, I'm almost managing to confuse myself. Don't worry about it for the moment. But we'll be looking at much more sophisticated while loops later on. For some reason, I've got an aeroplane going past. Uh, it always happens when I make videos. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select this system out or print line hello, and I'm going to just cut it. So Control X or Command X on the map. And I'm going to paste it between these curly brackets. That didn't go so well. Let me try again. There we go. And just to make sure the formatting's okay, I'm going to run the auto format. Control Shift F. Okay. That removed a few blank lines. Um, so we're saying while true is true, in other words, while forever, um, output hello. And if we run this little program now, then it outputs hello over and over again. It's going to keep doing that till I stop it. And probably my computer fan will start going pretty quickly because it's going to be using up too much processing power. I'm going to stop it by clicking this red button in the console. That stops your programs. So it's, it's now stopped. And I don't know if you can hear it, but my computer fan is kicking in. So it's not good to let these programs run for too long. Better if you just look, look for the sort of grayed out run terminate button in the console there and run it and then quickly stop it again. Uh, I'm not actually sure if this can be stopped. If I click in the console, no, I do control C. In a normal con console, typically control C might stop that program. But here it's doing nothing. So I'm just going to click use the terminate button. Okay, so uh, try that out for yourself. Um, try creating this little program. And before you run it, so you don't end up having to forcibly quit Eclipse or something, uh, make sure you can see this gray, it's grayed out at the moment, terminate button in the console. And then when you start seeing hello being output, hit that terminate button because you don't want to, you don't want this to overheat your computer. Okay, um, try that out for yourself and verify it works. And we'll be looking at some more stuff relevant to this in the next video. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're going to take a look at installing Eclipse, which is an integrated development environment. So hopefully by now you've installed the Java SDK, um, and what you need is some kind of editor to work in, because uh, Java programming is basically about creating text files. And in those text files, instead of writing in a human language, for example like English, you write in the Java programming language and then the software development kit that you've already installed will, behind the scenes, turn those into actual Java programs. Now, you can write Java code in any kind of text editor, even in sort of Windows Notepad or um, Mac text editor, whatever you like. But there is specialized software designed to make it easy to work with Java code. 
So one option would be, one good option, for example, would be to use a an editor that's actually designed for programmers to work with, like a, a programmer's editor. And at the moment, I'm, I'm here at the end of 2019, um, Visual Studio Code is actually a great option, uh, but we, we won't be using it in this course, and I, I will explain why. But if you search for Visual Studio Code, so this this is not Visual Studio. Um, Visual Studio is a is a what we call an IDE, an Integrated Development Environment. Um, but we're not going to be using that either, although I think you can. So if you search for Visual Studio Code, uh, you'll you'll find that there's a this is actually a an open source programmer's editor from Microsoft, uh, and it, it's it's really really good. It's really excellent. I highly recommend it. And you can install all kinds of plugins in it that make it work with various languages, including Java. Now, the problem with using a, a code editor to do your programming is that you've still got to somehow compile your programs. That is, you've got to take the text that you write and turn it into an actual piece of software and then actually run it. So one thing that... Um, probably a fair few Java programmers actually do is they will use a programmer's text editor like Visual Studio Code, like Emacs, or even Vim, uh, something like this. And then they'll on the command line, they'll actually compile and run their programs. I'm not going to be um, using the command line in this course, I don't think. And the reason for that is that I'm using a Mac, and you may be using Windows or Linux or a Mac. I don't know. Uh, and the actual sort of command line commands that you would need to write in a console to compile your Java programs would be slightly different between different operating systems. And I want to make this course in a way that it's good for anyone using any operating system within reason. And another reason that I'm not going to be using the command line is that most professional Java ed Java programmers do actually use a thing called an IDE. Now, IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment, and that's a fancy way of saying um, a text editor that's specialized for, usually for a particular programming language. And it will also have buttons to do things like compile your programs. In other words, take, take the text and turn it into a program, an actual piece of software and run the programs so that we don't have to mess around with the command line at all. And the one that we are going to use in this tutorial is a very excellent, very popular, completely free IDE called Eclipse. So I'm going to ask you to search for uh, Eclipse for Java developers, because that's what, what we will be using. Um, Eclipse, you can use it to write code in various programming languages and of course we want the one that's specifically configured to develop Java programs. So if you search for the Eclipse IDE for Java developers and go to that at eclipse.org and then download the one for your operating system, I can see here it says uh, a newer version of this is available, is available here so I'll just click on that link, get the latest version of it. You really want the absolute latest. Uh, in this case, and uh, download the version for your operating system and install that. Uh, and then all you have to do is, is start it up. Um, sometimes people find that there are error messages when Eclipse starts. Uh, Eclipse does depend on you already having installed the Java SDK, so you have to do that first. Um, if you've done that and then you install Eclipse and you get an error message, again, don't be afraid to put that error message into Google. So if it says, you know, no matter how ob obscure it is, if it says something like cannot find Java, then in type into Google Eclipse cannot find Java or whatever the error message says and see what the solution to it is. This this initial few steps is are particularly frustrating, or they can be. Hopefully everything will go smoothly, but 
some people are going to find that this doesn't go smoothly. And at that stage, it's really easy to just give up and say, I, I don't know what's going on here. It's too confusing. It's normal to feel confused at this stage, especially if you do encounter an error message. But you just have to get through this particular bit. And once we've got to the point where we can actually run, run Eclipse, write a program and run the program, and that's all working, then we'll have a lot smoother journey. So it's just this initial bit that's a bit tricky. So after you've installed Eclipse, start it up and you should see something that looks like this. And Eclipse usually starts up with, um, with a screen that looks similar to this. When Eclipse starts, it might ask you to set your workspace directory. And what that is, it's just a folder where Eclipse is going to put your code. So you can create that folder in advance if you like. Uh, put it in your, your documents folder or whatever. Call it workspace, call it anything you like. It doesn't matter. And then you have to just tell Eclipse to put your code in that folder. So in other words, you set your Eclipse workspace to that folder. And if you change your mind later, um, in one of the menus here, in the file menu, there's this option to switch workspace. And you can use that option to switch to a different folder. By default, it will be called workspace, but it doesn't have to be. That's, that's not important at all. So you can set that to wherever you like. Because I'm on a Mac here, um, my uh, directory structure looks like this. It starts with a slash. On Windows, it will probably look a little different, but that, does, that doesn't matter. Okay, uh, so hopefully you can get to this point where you can see Eclipse running. And then we don't need this. Um, we don't need this whole screen here, so I'm, I'm just going to close it with the sort of cross in the corner here, or ho however you close Windows on your system. And then we'll see something that looks like this. Quite intimidating, but as you'll see, um, it's not so bad. We're going to learn it bit by bit, and by the end of this course, you'll feel, I think, p fairly familiar with using Eclipse. Eclipse has an absolute ton of features and you can even install more via plugins, but we won't need most of those features. Uh, so there's no need to be frightened of it. Um, it is a bit intimidating when it starts up, but you'll see it's, it's not so bad. Okay, in the next video, we will look at actually creating a Java program. And until then, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're going to actually create and run a Java program. If you can get to the end of this uh, video and you can actually do this and make it work, then you can really give yourself a pat on the back because um, this is really something to create your first Hello World type computer program is, is really a great thing. It's really an important and wonderful step. And once you can do that, you're well on your way. So um, there are two ways I can create a Java project here. Um, you may or may not have this because different versions of Eclipse do sort of change a bit. But here it gives me an option that I can just click to create a Java project here in the area that we call the Package Explorer. So I can just click that, create a Java project. But I'm going to do it a different way that's more standard across different versions of Eclipse. I'm going to go to the File menu and I'm going to go to New Java Project. If you can't see Java Project here, then go to Other. And when you click Other, you'll have a whole list of different types of project. And you just have to go to Java and select Java Project. So it doesn't matter, just do one of these. But your goal is to create a new Java project. Okay, so let's go back and do it in a way that is most common, at least as far as I'm concerned. I'll go to the File menu, go to New Java Project, and we get this screen here. We need to give the project a name. Um, now usually that can be pretty much anything you like. Uh, this is just an Eclipse thing, it's not a Java thing. Uh, so um, there's, there's, no, there's no real rules about it. What I have found is that occasionally, occasionally, people run into problems if they have a space or some weird characters in a project name. Uh, weird characters, I suppose, from the point of view of the kind of standard Latin alphabet. Um, 
So what I'll do is I'll call this project Hello World. I'm giving it a capital H, capital W, but that's not important. It's just for readability. And I won't put any spaces in there just to be on the safe side. So we fill that in. Um, another thing to pay attention to is the version of Java that we're creating this project for. So here it says uh, use an execution environment JRE and that's set to version 12 of Java. But that's not what I'm using. I'm using version 11. So I'm going to select version 11 here. Um, this this says here the default compiler compliance level for the current workspace is 12. The new project will use a project specific compiler compliance level of 11. That's that's just kind of for information. It's not really important uh, for what we're doing here. The compiler compliance level is actually it, it's just talking about what version it, it expects your Java code to be. So it's saying that in this case, because I've selected uh, version 11 of Java, we're going to be writing Java in a Java 11 type of style. Java is backwards compatible. So if you write um, code for version 8, it will still usually work in, it should work I think, always probably, in version 10 or version 12. Okay, um, so you just need to make sure here that you have Java version 11 selected. And for, for the most of what we're doing here, even version 9 would be alright. Version 8 of Java would be alright for most of it. Uh, and version 10 would probably be alright maybe for the entire course. Uh, so um, you could even use version 10. You could use even version 8 for most of what we're doing here. Okay. Alright, so we give the project a name. We make sure we've got Java Standard Edition version 11 selected. And if not, you can try playing around with these, but hopefully this will all go pretty smoothly and you can just use that there. Okay, click Next. Um, so uh, on this screen, the only option that we need to pay attention to is we've got this option to create module-info.java. Um, Java mod modules are a fairly new addition to Java. Um, they were added a few versions ago and uh, we're going to look at them later in the course but to start with we're not going to use them because they will only complicate things further so I'm going to untick that that's the only change that I'm going to make then I'm going to click finish hopefully um, you'll get a project generated now and you can expand it and look into it uh, you will have included in the project the it will say JRE, JRE system library should be version 11 here that's just a load of stuff. Um, it's a load of basic Java stuff. Um, it's a load of sort of code that lets you build upon it to do things in Java, basically. And we've got this source folder, and the source folder is where our, co where our code actually goes. Now I'm going to select the kind of root folder there, Hello World. I'm going to right-click it, and I'm going to go to New Class. And I'm going to go back and explain this more in the next video. Uh, for now, we're just going to do it. So we need to create a new class in our project. I need to give it a name. And the name that I'm going to give it, uh, I'm going to call it App. Now, that can be what you want. But I, I would suggest using App to start with, for just for consistency with these videos. Uh, it, it should have an upper class first name. And the rest of the letters in it should be lowercase. Unless you've got multiple words, in which case each word starts with an uppercase letter. But we'll, we'll be seeing more of that later. For now, just call it app, A-P-P. -P. Uh, the package, we don't have to fill this in. But if we don't fill it in, we might get a warning. Packages, again, we'll be talking about those later on. Uh, they're just a way of organizing Java code. Uh, kind of like a folder, really. Uh, so for the moment, um, I'm, I just need to give the package some name. Uh, I might just use my initials, JWP. You can use yours. Now, the thing about the package is, is the letters in it should be lowercase. So I, I would say for the moment, 
just use your initials or whatever. Uh, you could you could even call it hello, something like that. Maybe I'll call it hello. But they should be lowercase, and and for the moment, don't put any symbols or anything like that in there. And we'll talk more about packages later on in the course. Another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tick this box to create a public static void main string array args. Now, of course, that looks incomprehensible to you if you're new to Java. That's fine. But tick that box. That's really important. So we've added a name for the class that begins with an uppercase first letter. We've given a package a name, um, and that's all lowercase letters, no spaces or anything. And I've ticked that I want to create a public static void main, and the other options I've just left them as they are. And I click Finish. Uh, and then we've got our Java program. Uh, and in fact, I'll leave it here in this video, um, and we'll will actually make this do something, I think, in the next video. Now, I know that this has a recipe book feel. I know that you don't understand what you're doing unless you've, you're have you already a bit familiar with Java. You won't understand this. That's fine. It's normal. It won't be like that for the entire course, but we just need to get started. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello. In this video, we are actually going to run a program. Okay, so we've so far we've created what we call a class, and the class is a text file with the extension .java. It's uh, in a particular location in our project. You should have something that looks kind of like this. Hello, there is the package, and in the package is a class called, in this case, app.java. Um, I'm going to add some code in this um, class here, and then we're going to be able to run it. So here it says to do auto generated method stub. So it's telling me that um, this is automatically generated, and I can replace this thing here with some code. So this is actually a comment, it starts with two slashes. Uh, if, if you don't have that, don't worry. The, the really important thing is that you need to write some code and you need to write it in the correct place between these two brackets. We'll talk a little bit about the structure of this class, I think, in the next video. Um, but for now, notice it says at the top it's got package and your package name. Then we've got public class and the name of the class, which is app. We've got two curly brackets. Now, within those two curly brackets, we've got this public static void main string array args. We'll be talking about this. Uh, I know it's all horribly complicated looking at the moment. And within those two brackets here, that's where we need to write our own code. I'm going to get rid of this comment. It, it's not doing anything, so I'll just delete it. And in there, I'm going to write sysout. And I'm going to hold down uh, on a Mac command key and probably on Windows a control key, and I'm going to press the space bar. Actually, what am I saying? On a Mac, it's also control. Hold down the control key and press the space bar. And what should happen is it auto-completes to this. It says system.out.println, and there's a couple of round brackets and a semicolon. If for some reason autocomplete is not working in your Eclipse, uh, you can maybe Google autocomplete Eclipse, um, try and find out why it's not working. It, hopefully it should work. It should be control and spacebar, I think, uh, pretty much on any operating system. So w what, that, what that did, it, was, it, it, it simply takes a shortcut, a shortcut phrase, sysout, S-Y-S-O-U-T, and it changes it into a bit of actual legitimate Java code. So it's just a, that's just a way of avoiding typing this out because um, we'll probably have to type this a lot and it's just quicker to type sys out. But if you can be bothered, if you have the patience, you can just type system.out.println, two round brackets and then a semicolon. Now I'm going to click inside these two round brackets and put in two speech marks. And in fact, if I type one speech mark, Eclipse automatically puts in the other one for me. Now, inside those two speech marks, I'm going to type hello world 
and this is just text and I can put what I like but you have to be aware that there are some special characters some kinds of punctuation uh, for example like the backslash character which if you type that in here it won't work you just need some ordinary text in there and if you want you can have a full stop or period as you call it in America and uh, you know or an exclamation mark or whatever okay that'll do the trick now I want to make sure that that is saved so I'm going to go up to the top left here and click this save all button then it sort of goes gray okay so I've got my my program and it's saved there are several different ways you can run it um, one way is um, make sure the file is selected app.java and click this green run button another way is to right click app.java and go to run as hopefully you can see that Java application Let's just scroll down a bit here so run as Java application and I get that menu by right clicking it but what I'm going to do is just um, select app.java and click the green run button in the top left here and if you do that you should see some output at the bottom and it should say hello world or whatever you've typed in those speech marks um, if you don't see this console tab you should you should see it when you run your program and if you don't in window and uh, show view you can click to make sure the console is actually showing uh, so that catches some people out but if you just installed Eclipse the console should be visible so you see there's a bunch of tabs here one of them's console and that's where your program output appears okay so if you try that you should find that you can run the program by clicking that run button and it should say hello world if you if anything goes wrong um, go over the video carefully make sure you've done every step correctly if you get any error messages type them into Google or an internet search engine and um, just search for the error message and see what comes up see what people suggest about how to fix the problem hopefully this will go smoothly and when you've done that you've run your first Java program and I know you're, you're going to be totally confused and in the next video I think uh, we'll talk a little bit about this program and what what it is and how it works okay so if, if you can actually get it to run that's a major step forward it's, it's really really fantastic and it is normal at this stage to, be, to feel very confused expect to feel confused that's normal okay until next time happy coding hello in this and the next video I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we've actually created um, and I'm not going to be able to explain all of it at the moment because there's just too much going on here for you to understand at this stage in the course you will understand it later on but for now I just want to talk a little bit just to familiarize just, just to sort of familiarize you a little bit with what's going on here so you'll feel hopefully a little bit less confused and if you've actually created your own program here and you've run it and it says hello world or whatever then that's really a great achievement so you, sh you should be proud of that that's a fantastic start okay so um, let's take a look at what Eclipse has generated in this video so um, if you click your project and um, you you right click it so I should say click click the project name in the package explorer here and then right click it and go to properties and if on this dialog if you've got resource selected on the top left here then where it says location that will show you where your project is located and of course it's located in whatever folder you um, set the workspace to be so actually let's take a look at that on the disk so we'll go to it and um, my workspace folder is this I called it workspace and you don't have to but I did and in there we've got a folder for the project and it's called hello world it's named after the project we click on that and in there we've got a bin and a source folder now you don't have to have these folders in the Java project so if you have decided for some reason 
to follow this using, for example, Visual Studio Code, and you're, you've looked up how to compile and run Java programs on the command line, then maybe you haven't created these. It is good practice to create them, bin and source, but um, they're not a part of the Java language. They're more like a sort of tradition or standard in Java. The bin folder is where Eclipse puts your compiled programs. So when you take text files that, are, that contain text written in a programming language and you turn them into a program, some software does that and the software is in your Java development kit. That process of turning text files into an actual runnable program that your computer understands is called building the program or compiling the program. These these are technically different, but um, for the moment we'll just talk about compiling the program. So you're taking text files, turning them into an actual computer program, and that stuff gets put in the bin folder. And you can look at it if you want, and you'll see an app.class file in there. That's what's actually r being run when you run your program. Now in the source folder here, that's where we put our source code. The source code is the stuff that we're writing. Uh, and in there, there's a folder called hello. The reason I've got a folder called hello is because I called my package hello. When I created this app.java class, which is what this is, this app.java is a class, I put it in a package called hello. So there's a folder called hello. Don't worry about these terms at the moment. I'm just beginning to use them so you get a feeling of familiarity with them, but you don't need to know exactly what they are at the moment. It's okay. So if we go into the hello folder, there's my app.java text file. That's what we've actually written. And that's this text file here. Okay. So what we've got is we've got a project located in the workspace. The project has one package in it called hello. So that, that's in its own folder. And inside that folder is a text file, app.java. And a text file has Java code in it that defines a class. And that, um, that app.java gets turned into a class file, which is located in our bin folder. So it's worth having a look at that in Windows Explorer or Mac Finder or whatever you're using, your file explorer. Just have a look at this, just to feel a bit more familiar with it. Um, in the next video, we'll talk a little bit about the code that we've actually written. Um, and all of this stuff, I'm just giving you a very rough overview. You don't have to really understand what I'm saying in any depth. I'm just beginning to familiarize you with it. But we will be going over it a lot more in the rest of the course. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about the code that we've actually created. Now, there are a lot of concepts packed into this short piece of code. It's very cryptic looking, even though it's a basic, sort of what we call a hello world type of program. Uh, you won't understand all of these concepts um, until you've gone through more of the course. So what I want to do here is just run through it quickly so you have a vague idea about it, just to try to make you feel a little bit less confused. It's not important to remember or memorize what I'm saying here because my entire object is, is really not to teach you stuff at this point but to reduce the confusion more like. Okay, so let's just talk about this a little bit. So Java code is organized into packages. We, we create text files with the extension .java and we group them together in what we call packages. We created one package called hello and that's why the, the, this app.java file starts with the statement package hello. It finishes in a semicolon and that's very important. Many programming languages use a semicolon to end a statement. And a statement is a kind of, it's like a sentence in English. It's a little bit of computer code that does one particular thing and it ends in a semicolon. Following that, we've got a definition of a class. 
A class is like the basic unit of Java code. You can have multiple classes in one text file, but usually, most of the time, you create one class per text file in Java. And usually, the class has to have the same name as the file that it's in. So that's why we've got a class here called app, and it's in a file called app.java. Capitalization is also very important. Class has to have an uppercase first letter, and so does the text file that it's in. You can't have spaces or weird punctuation in it or anything like that. So we've got a class here, and curly brackets define what we call the scope of the class. They define the contents of the class. Within the class, we've got a single subroutine. That's a block of code that contains a bunch of statements that actually accomplish something. Now this is a, a subroutine uh, called main and in Java subroutines sort of collections of lines of code are called methods. So what we hear what we have here is a main method and the main method is where your Java program starts it's where it starts running from. Uh, this this says string array args. We'll be looking at all of this stuff later, so don't worry about it at the moment. But this would allow us to pass in information from the command line if we are running this program on the command line. It's a collection of bits of text, essentially, but it doesn't matter for the moment. Uh, so we've got this main method, this main subroutine, and the scope of that is, again, defined by two curly brackets. So there's a method called main, and then we've got some content of it that goes between two curly brackets. And all of that is nested inside this class definition. And what is the actual content of our main method here? Well, it's one single statement. And this says system.out.println. Uh, print in programming terminology means to display on the console. So when we, we talk about printing text, and we don't mean we don't mean anything to do with an actual printer, we just mean display it on the console, print it. So we've printed hello world on the console down here. I don't know if you can see that down here. There we go. That we printed that text. The text that we wanted to print is enclosed in double quotes here. So this is just normal, ordinary, human-readable text. The, whoa, the, only, the, only un, the only unusual thing about it is that there are some things you can't put in there because they have a special meaning in Java. So for the moment, just stick to ordinary text. But you can have spaces and things in because between these double quotes, it's just ordinary text. Um, and that, because this is a statement, this bit here, it finishes with a semicolon. A system.out.println, print ln, it says, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's a mouthful. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at, you'll understand more about what that is later on. Uh, but just understand for a moment that this is how we display text on the console in a Java program. That's all it is. Uh, this actual text is called an argument to this method, print print line. Uh, so that's, that's some terminology for you, and it's a, maybe it gives you a very vague idea about what this program does. Or maybe not. Maybe you just feel even more confused than to start with. Either way, that's okay. That's all right. What we're going to be doing in the next few videos, and for quite a while probably, is just adding more text here. We're going to add more lines in so that we can do more stuff, and we're going to look at the real basics, the real fundamentals the nuts and bolts of computer programming. And we're going to gradually build up your skill level and hopefully you'll gradually feel less confused. It is really important to type this out though. You have to type stuff because just watching the video won't be enough. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're going to talk a little bit about the main method and we're going to add some more statements to our main method. So far we've got this program here, all it does is when you run it, it outputs some text. Hello world in this case. Let's recreate that program and it's, it's a really good idea to try yourself 
creating basic Java Hello World programs from scratch because you want to sort of drill that into your mind and memorize it. So we go to File, New Java Project, and give it a name. Let's call this um, Main Method. So I'm going to check that I'm using Java 11 in this case. Click Next. I don't need a module, so I'll untick this and we'll click Finish. Then, without even expanding the, the, um, the project, I can just right-click it and go to New Class. Let's call the class App. We can call it more or less anything as long as it's got a first case. Uh, an uppercase first letter and no spaces or punctuation or anything like that. The package, I'm going to call it application. This has to have a lowercase first letter. And I'm going to tick to say that I want a public static void main. And I'm going to click finish. Then finally, I can add some code to my main method. So between these two inner brackets here, I'm going to delete the comment. I'm going to type sysout. And I'm going to type, um, well, hello world again, let's say. Uh, so notice I'm indenting um, the code within brackets. So this code is indented within these brackets using a tab in this case. And this, this code here is indented within these brackets. We're going to talk more about that in the next video. Let's just run it and check it works. It's a good idea always to try running your Java projects early on to make sure there's not some misconfiguration or anything. And there we go, it says hello world, just like the other program. So let's have a look at this. So I want to focus in this video on this, the main method. So a method in, um, well in, uh, what we're doing here is object-oriented programming. So Java is an object-oriented language. And it's hard to understand what that is until you know what an object is. So we'll leave that for the moment and tackle it later. But in object-oriented programming languages, subroutines are known as methods. This is an example of a method. It's a method called main. And what a method is, it's, it's a block of code. So it's a collection of statements like this one. This is a statement. It ends in a semicolon. And in this case, the main method is very special because it's where our Java program starts executing, starts running, in other words. So when you run a Java program, what gets run is the content of the main method. Now we can put more statements in here. Have a go at this yourself, maybe either pause the video or after the video. Let's add a new line, and e Eclipse helpfully puts the cursor in an appropriate place, usually. So we want to make sure that the statements that we write here are lined up with this system.out.print line statement. Let's add another one. So sysout, control space. This is another line of text. Don't forget those speech marks there. So if you type one, Eclipse puts in the other automatically, usually. And don't forget the semicolon either, because it, it won't work without this semicolon at the end. Let's run that, and we should get two lines of text, like this. Here we are. We can put more in. Let's put one more in. Let's write sys out and... Um, final line of text. You can type what you want within reason really. And we'll run that again. So let's run it. There we go. And it looks like this. Try that out. It might not seem like much, but uh, we're building up gradually and it's going to get hard enough later on. So you want to really get these basics down. Notice I've left a blank line there. Um, I don't have to. We'll talk about that more in the next video, but uh, space within a Java program is not important. We could also write it like this, and that would, ju that would work just as well. Let's run this. So the important 
sort of takeaway message for this video is when your Java program runs, um, the, the Java runtime environment will search for a main method, a method called main, and that's what this is. In other words, a subroutine, which has the sort of correct syntax and is called main. And then it's going to run the statements within main, and it's going to run them in the order that you see them. And this, this can get a lot more complicated, as we'll see later on. But for a simple program like this, um, we're, we're just going to step down the statements here. They're going to get run one after the other. So first that, then that, and so on. Um, in the sort of initial part of this course, um, we'll stick with just writing code here. And later on, we'll see what else you can do with methods and classes and objects and all that sort of thing. So try that for yourself. Try putting space in or no space. Have a go at it. Put some more lines in your main method and run it. Okay, so that's it for this video. In, in, and until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're going to talk a bit about formatting. And this is an, an incredibly important topic. We're soon going to look on, we're going to go on to look at the, really the fundamental nuts and bolts of programming. Um, but it's important that we get this right at the start. There are some things that we must get right before we really even begin. Um, and this is one of them. So let's create a new project. Let's go to File, New Java Project. I won't keep doing this with every video, but I'm doing this just a few times because it is important that you remember it and do try it yourself. Let's, let's call this Formatting. And make sure I've got Java 11 selected. Click Next. Untick Create Module Info, because we're not going to use that now. Click Finish. And right-click the project that's been generated and go to New Class. Let's give it a class called App and put it in a pa package called Application and tick to say that I want a public static void main. Click Finish. OK, so we can add some statements to this. Now, I, I want to just point out um, Java is um, Java is a programming language that has been influenced by various other programming languages. And two particular influences on Java were C and C++. So um, in Java, if we create a statement, let's write sysout hello. So this is a statement. It's kind of one piece of code that does something. And uh, it finishes in a semicolon. And that idea of finishing statements with a semicolon um, comes from C and C++. Uh, maybe there were other languages that used that idea earlier, but as far as Java is concerned, this is a C or C++ thing. And C and C++ were two pro are two programming languages that have been around for absolutely ages and are still extremely widely used. Similarly, these curly brackets, they're a C and also a C++ thing. So they come from these other programming languages, as do many other things in Java. Now, um, there are fundamentally, um, basically two different ways of um, formatting your brackets in these programming languages. So one way is um, when you open a curly bracket like this, like this one here, or this one here, here. Um, one style puts each opening curly bracket on its own line, like this. Now you can use that in Java, but um, I don't recommend it because by far the most popular style in Java is to put the opening curly brackets on the same line as um, the sort of code that identifies what's about to happen in these curly brackets. So um, the curly brackets and the code within them, we call it a code block. And code blocks usually have something written before them that basically says what they are or what they do. So we put the, the opening curly bracket on the same line as that bit of code that says basically what's going to happen essentially in, in the code block. 
Um, so I recommend you use this, use this style and Eclipse makes it easy to type code like this anyway. Um, space doesn't really matter in a Java program. Uh, you can, you can put blank lines in, let's type sys out, how are you? You can put them in where you want them and you basically just add blank lines for readability. I am a computer. So that will run. And uh, we could also do it without those, without so many blank lines. Uh, on the Mac here, I can use Command D to delete an entire line. And I think on Windows, probably Control D will do the trick. That's a handy shortcut. So put blank lines in and you use space generally to make your program readable. Try strive always to make your program look beautiful, you know, and look look um, logical and readable. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to talk about auto formatting in the next video, and we're going to talk about indentation, which is a very important aspect of formatting. So until next time, happy coding. Hello. In this video, we're going to take a look at auto format, which is really important and very, very useful. So hopefully by now you've created a program yourself with three lines in it or more, however many you like, and we'll, we'll use that to talk about formatting. Uh, so we've seen that um, if you have curly brackets like this, an opening and closing curly bracket, that's known as a code block. So we have a code block here and there's another code block here. Now, when we put one code block inside another, so this code block is inside this code block, and here we have statements within a code block. And when you put um, when you put code inside a code block, or you put yeah one code block inside another, it's really important to indent it. So you see that um, all the code within these curly brackets is indented by one tab and all the code within these curly brackets is indented by another tab. And that's that, although that's cosmetic, so the program works without it, let's try this, it's nevertheless extremely important to get this right. Um, because if you don't have correct formatting in your code, it will be very, very difficult to read. It will look a mess. So always strive to um, to format your code nicely and pay particular attention to indentation. Make sure that you indent one block of code within another like this. Um, you might have seen a American TV series called Silicon Valley and in that the protagonist is a computer programmer and at one point he has a girlfriend who's also a computer programmer and they they have an argument and they end up sort of splitting up because um, they can't agree about whether it's better to use spaces or tabs to do indentation. So to in indent some code within a code block, let's take this as an example, you could use four spaces. Typically it will be four, one, two, three, four. And you can also use a tab like this. I just press the tab key there. There are pros and cons to both of these. So it can get annoying to have to keep typing spaces and even hearing people typing spaces. You know, that can, that can get quite annoying by itself. But spaces tend to have a consistent appearance uh, across different editors. This is probably less important now than it used to be in the past, but I, I think it's still true that spaces give you um, better consistency when you write code in one editor and load it into another. On the other hand, they're annoying to type and that's why I greatly prefer tabs because just one tab can indent your code. So this will be indented two tabs because it's within two code blocks. It's within that and within that. Um, so I, I recommend using tabs to indent your code, but if you were working with a team of programmers and they were all using spaces, you should use spaces instead because the worst thing you can do is mix 
tabs and spaces. Um, that tends to mean that when you load code written in one ed editor into another editor, um, it will it will lose its formatting and it will get out of line. So pick one of these for four spaces or a tab to do the indent indentation and stick to it. Many editors these days will allow you to change spaces into tabs if you want. So I'm sure you can conflict, configure that in Eclipse. You can make it change a tab into a space and also into four spaces, sorry. And also Eclipse helps you. So if you type a line, so if I'm at the end of this line here and I hit return, it puts the cursor in the right place so that we don't have to worry too much about indenting. So that's very helpful. Now, um, here's uh, the most important sort of takeaway message for this video. Uh, you can automatically format your code. So let's put maybe a bracket in the wrong place here and put excessive spaces in and maybe indent this too much. If I write, if I select app.java, right click it and go to source and where are we? Source and format. It automatically formats my code for me. It will take out um, duplicated blank lines and it will line up brackets and stuff like that. And that's incredibly helpful. Um, not only because it makes the code a lot easier to read, but also because if you made a mistake there, so if you've maybe missed off a bracket and you try to format it, then it will um, it won't format or the formatting will go a bit strange. And that's that's really helpful for spotting where you've gone wrong. Let's put that bracket in again. Also, you can see an error down there. There's, there was a, there's a red error marker that appears if you've done something wrong. This says insert um, bracket to complete class body in this particular case. Let's put that back in. Now, uh, you can also format using a keyboard shortcut. And I strongly recommend that you memorize this shortcut and you use it constantly. Some people think that beginners are better off um, using a text editor that doesn't have auto formatting. And the reasoning is that um, that forces people to really learn to do the formatting themselves. But in my experience, if beginners use auto format a lot, they gradually become used to the formatting. I think that's the quickest way to learn it. So I'm going to be um, suggesting that you uh, auto format your code constantly, do it all the time. And the way that we do it, as we've seen, we could right click and go to source format, but it's quicker to use a, a keyboard shortcut. And on the Mac, that's command shift F. And on the Windows, on Windows, it's control shift F. So um, here I'm using a Mac, so I'm going to, with one hand, my left hand, I'm going to hold down command and shift. And with my right hand, I'm going to just press F. And that's formatted my code for me. Let's try that again. So control shift F or command shift F on the Mac. Great. So um, it's important to do that all the time. Do it constantly. Try to write code in the first place that's formatted nicely, but um, also use auto format constantly to check that your formatting is okay. And eventually this will become second nature to you because you'll be doing it all the time. And that really, really helps to make code that's easy to read. And it really, really helps to um, keep basic errors out of your code. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're going to start looking at variables and variables are one of the most important basic building blocks of computer programs. So we'll get started with them here. I've created a project called Integer Variables. I've given it a, um, a class called app which has a main method and I put one statement in there, it just says hello. So um, you should try that for yourself and check that you can run it. And then let's add some more code to this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually click after the opening bracket here and hit return a couple of times. 
just so that I can get a couple of blank lines above this statement and after the opening curly bracket. And here I'm going to type, well, we need a name for our variable and we need to think about what it's actually going to refer to. A variable is, um, it's kind of a way of referring to some sort of value or some sort of entity that can change as your program progresses. And that's why it's called a variable, because it varies. Let's imagine that you keep cats and you've got some quantity of cats in your house. Uh, so what we want is a variable that can hold the number of cats we've currently got. Maybe, um, maybe sometimes your friend takes some of them or uh, you know, you, you acquire more cats. So the number of cats that you've got can change. Okay, so I'm going to write here int and then a space and then cats and then a semicolon. Uh, so what's going on here? Well, first of all, let's deal with this yellow warning. So you see this yellow underlining here and in the margin, there's a little yellow icon. It's like a light bulb with an exclamation mark in this, this version of Eclipse. If I hover over it, it says the value of the local variable cats is not used. What it's telling me is that I've created a variable, a thing called a variable, and uh, I'm not using it. And that's true. So warnings are things that you might want to pay attention to in your program. You don't really want to have any warnings in your program when you run it. But unlike an error, a warning won't stop your program actually running. So I can actually run this program still. It, it does actually run. Um, so if you see a red icon here, well, there's red underlining, that's an error. And an error is, is a problem. It will stop your program compiling. You won't be able to run it. But this is just a warning, so we can run it. Okay. Um, now, what have we done here? Well, this is a statement, finishes in a semicolon. And we've essentially said that it, it's a bit like creating a sort of bucket in this case. Um, it's a bucket big enough to hold um, numbers and it's the right type of bucket for holding numbers. If you wanted to hold text or something, we'd need something different. So um, int is, uh, we call it the type of the variable. And int is a primitive data type, we call it in Java. And cats is just a name I've made up. To It's like sticking a label on a bucket and writing cats on it. So um, we've got our bucket, which can hold numbers because we've used the keyword int. And we've stuck a label on that bucket called and written cats on it. Int is short for integer. And integers, integer just means a whole number. It can be positive or negative, but it's a number. So we can assign a value to that. Let's do this. So I'm going to go to maybe the next line and write cats equals seven semicolon. What have we done now? Well, we've taken the number seven and we've stored it in this variable. Or well, we, we say that we've assigned the value seven to this variable. And it's like taking the number seven and putting it in our bucket. This is going to seem confusing at first, but after you, after you practiced it a bit, it won't be. And finally, let's output this value. So I've got system.out.print line here, and I'm going to get rid of this text. So get rid of the stuff in the speech marks. So it looks like this. And then between these round brackets, I'm going to type cats. So we're saying display the value of this variable. Let's click run. And then it says there in the console, it says seven. So just to go through that again quickly, um, we wanted a variable that can refer to a number. And um, we've written int, that's short for integer, because we want to create some space in the computer's memory, essentially, that can hold a number. And this, this process here, we call it declaring a variable. And really, it's like creating a bucket of the right size and type to hold a number and then sticking a label on it and writing cats on that label. Here, we've assigned a value to the variable 
And that's a bit like taking the number seven and putting it in this bucket. So we say that we've assigned a, val assigned a value to the variable cats and it's we that value is seven that we've assigned. And then finally, we've printed the value. So that comes out on the console. Try this for yourself. Um, the order matters. You've got to have these in the right order and check that you can get this to work. And then we'll see what we can do with variables. So until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video, we're going to take a further look at variables and we're going to look at adding numbers together. Um, if you feel confused at this stage, uh, that's absolutely normal. You probably should feel confused, um, but uh, things are gonna get clearer as you go through the course. As long as you practice what we're doing, it's very important that you try, try this out for yourself. Um, incidentally, uh, you might wonder what kinds of variables there are in Java. And we're going to be looking, that, looking at that in the course. But for now, um, I just want to direct your attention to a page. If you type into a search engine, Java primitive, primitive types, and maybe click on one of these links. Let's go to the sort of official Oracle documentation primitive data types in Java. And you can see here, don't you don't have to read this or anything, but you can see that there's, there are various types listed and int is one of them. You can also see that it has a maximum value that we can put in it. That's um, two to the power of 31 minus one. There's a reason why it's such a strange kind of value, but we needn't go into that. And the minimum value you can put in is minus 2 to the power of 31. Okay, don't worry about that though. Um, let's have a look then. So what, what can we do with this? Well, one thing we can do is addition. And uh, in fact, the way I've written this here is unnecessarily verbose. We can do this uh, more briefly, more quickly. So um, I've declared a variable here. I've declared a variable called cats. And here I've assigned the value seven to the variable cats. We can do that in one single step. Before we do that, let's create a duplicate of our project. And if you're working on um, code uh, and you've got something that works and then you don't want to disturb that, um, or it's possible that you might mess it up with how you're about to change it, it's a really good idea to take a copy of it. Either that, or you could use a version control system like Git, for example, but um, we're just gonna make a copy. So I'm gonna right click my project and go to copy. And I'm just gonna click in a blank space in Eclipse in the Package Explorer. Right click and go to paste. And um, we can give this a new name now. Let's call it addition and click copy. So now we've got a new project. Um, I would recommend creating projects from scratch until you you feel completely familiar with that rather than just copying projects. But anyway, um, so let's run that. So I'm gonna select my, my app, click run, and it runs just as before. But now let's delete this um, int cats and um, so now we've got an error. Why have we got an error? It's because, let's hover over the error. It says cats cannot be resolved to a variable. That's because I'm trying to output the value contained in this cats variable, but I haven't declared the cats variable and I haven't assigned the value to it. What we're gonna do now is declare it and assign a value in a single step. Now this has to be above where you're using the variable. So wherever you use a variable, above that somewhere in your code, you have to declare it. So um, let's write int cats equals seven. So I'm declaring it and I'm assigning a value to it in one single step. Remember, uh, your program is gonna execute line by line. So it's gonna go down your code, your code block here. And that's why we've, we've first got to declare a variable before we can use it. Um, it has to be above uh, because this is going to get read 
uh, by the Java runtime environment before this is read and executed. Okay, um, so that, that will do the same as the program we had before. We can run it and it just outputs seven. Now let's say we've also got dogs. So um, let's write int dogs equals, uh, let's say we've got five dogs and by some miracle we can stop the dogs eating the cats. Again, we've got a warning because we've not used the value of dogs yet. What I'm going to do is add these together and to do that I need a third variable. I'm going to type int total equals cats plus dogs and then using my system.out.print line I'm going to output the value of total it should be 12 so let's let's run this and down here we have 12 what have we done here um, so we declare a variable called cats and assign the value 7 to it we declare a variable called dogs assign the value 5 to it and then we declare a variable called total and the value that we assign to total is the number of cats plus the number of dogs and then we output it. Try that for yourself. Um, if you, uh, it, it is easy to make mistakes here. So for example, you can't have two variables called cats in, in your code block here. If we try that, we get an error. If we hover over the error, it says duplicate local variable cats. Let's delete the second one. In fact, in Eclipse, if I just put my cursor on a line and then in the Mac, if I do Command D or in Windows, I think it will be Control D, that deletes the line. So it's quite a handy shortcut. Control D or Command D to delete a line. Um, if, if I'm giving any, any of the wrong shortcuts for Windows, you can always uh, type into a search engine something like um, Eclipse shortcuts, Eclipse shortcut keys, something like that, and you'll find a whole list quite easily. Okay, so try replicating this program. Try changing these numbers to different numbers and see if it still works. Uh, you can also try giving them different names so they don't have to be cats, dogs, and total. You might run into problems. You can't have spaces in variable names. You can't have punctuation in there. Uh, you should always start them with a lowercase first letter. That is very important. Without that, your program will work. So I, I could write total here with a capital T and it would still run, probably. Well, it would do if I, I have to change both of them, of course. Um, well, that's not obvious. Let me explain that. Let's run this. So that works with a capital T on total, for example, or I could put a capital C cats or a capital D on dogs, but it's very bad practice. The standard in Java is that variables start with a lowercase first letter. So if you're using the conventional coding style in Java, which we are, you should always start your variables with a lowercase first letter. Don't do anything crazy with them. For the moment, just keep them all lowercase uh, and notice that Java is case sensitive. So um, a variable called dogs with a capital D is different to a variable called dogs with a lowercase d. See, that's only a warning. Whereas if I had lowercase d, I get an error. Seems to be some street cleaning taking place outside. Apologies for the noise. Okay, anyway, so let's get rid of that. What we What we want to aim for at the moment is creating legal reasonable code written in the standard style. So create something that looks like this and try it out and try tweaking it. Change the numbers, change the variable names, see if you can get it to work. And don't, don't forget that if you change cats here, you have to change the name of it here as well. Um, the same for all of these variables. You have to be consistent. Okay, have a go at that. And until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're going to take a look at outputting variables. So, um, so far we've got this really simple program and I've, I've created a copy of this and I've called it outputting variables. So maybe create a new program yourself and um, we're going to change this code.
Okay, so um, one thing uh, I should say here is that it's it's really really valuable to just type stuff over and over again. Um, I think it's it's too easy to imagine that programming is primarily an intellectual exercise. Of course, it is an intellectual exercise, but a lot of the learning that you need to uh, undertake is kind of related to your fingers. It, you have to get into the habit of typing things and getting used to typing them. And uh, you sort of develop a kind of a, almost a muscle memory uh, and you, you get used to just typing particular programming constructs. So um, rather than copy your last project, always type it out again for the moment. Um, if you want to really accelerate your learning, learn to touch type, type without looking at the keys and you can find lots of programs on the internet to um to help you with that but anyway okay so i've got this program here and um we're outputting the value total but i can actually add some text to that so within the round brackets here of system.out.print line i'm going to write um total number of animals let's put a colon there this is just text and then a space and then I'll close the speech mark like this. And then after the closing speech mark here, so after this, I'm going to put a space and a plus, space, and then total. Now before we discuss what this is, let's see it running. Let's run it. And it says total number of animals, 12, which is much more helpful. If you're actually going to write a program, for example, I don't know, to help you calculate something, help you do your tax, whatever, um, obviously it's very useful to output text with your numbers. So we've already used a plus sign here. And what this plus sign did was um, it added the values stored in these two variables together. Or as a quick way of saying that, I could say that it adds these two variables together. It adds the number of cats and the number of dogs, adding cats and dogs. These two variables are both of type int or integer variables. Now what we're doing here is something different. The plus sign actually has a different meaning. We've got some text here and we are adding a an integer to it. Um, so you, you can't add text to integers. You can't add, like, the word giraffe to the number 13, let's say. It makes no sense. What this is actually doing is it's turning this um, number into some text and concatenating it with this text. So it's, it's essentially it's, it's joining the number to some text. It's kind of a text operation. And the result is what we see in the console below, which is this. We can also output, um, so after we've declared the variables and given them values, we can output all of them if we want. Let's write that. Let's try that. Let's write sysout control space and um, number of cats and plus cats. Notice that I, I left a space before the closing speech mark. Um, the, everything within the closing speech mark, within the speech marks, is just text. So even this space is just some text. But it looks nicer when it's output if we put space there because we get this nice space here. And it's really important to strive for legibility and beauty in all of your coding. It'll make it a lot easier. So if I write number of cats and then plus cats and then output that. Let's run it. So it says number of cats, 7. Total number of animals, 12. Let's output the number of dogs as well. So I'm going to write it here. Number of dogs. One thing this is really useful for is helping you to get bugs out of your code. Because whatever variables you have in your program, you can quickly output the values of them just using sysout system.out.print line and that can be very very helpful so now we're outputting the number of cats dogs and the total number of them 
Let's take a look. There we go. And let's also add some other number of animals in here. So I could write int. What else would you keep in your house? Maybe some people keep rats. I don't see how it's going to be possible to keep all these animals from devouring each other. But anyway, so int rats equals, let's say we've got three rats, which is three too many in my opinion, but you know, each to their own. So we've said int total equals cats plus dogs. We can just add another plus there and we can write rats. We can add them all together. Cats plus dogs plus rats. Let's output the number of rats as well. Since we've output the number of cats and dogs. Number of rats and plus rats. So we, we're just using this plus to join the number of rats with this text here. Okay, finally, let's try this. And there we go. We've got number of cats, number of dogs, number of rats, and the total animals is 15, which is too many, but there you go. Okay, try this for yourself. Um, experiment a little bit, add, add stuff together. It doesn't have to be animals, can be whatever you want. The important thing is to type it out and create your project from scratch as well. Don't copy it. Um, copying is useful. Um, but uh, at this stage, the important thing is to get practice writing out code. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video, we're going to take a look at another type called double. So um, you might wonder what you're supposed to do if you have a floating point value. So instead of having seven or five or 1,329 or whatever, you have something like, let's say, 8.3, something with a point in it. And for that, there's another type that you can use called double. In fact, there are um, at least two different types. Well, in a way, there are a number of different types you can use to do all of these things. But we're, we're just covering the most, some of the most basic, most common, most fundamental types here. And incidentally, before I get started, I just want to point something out, which I'm going to return to later. Um, which is that if you have multiple projects like this, then um, you, you want to make sure that you're always running what you think you're running. It's a bit easy to get into the habit of clicking that run button and then running the wrong thing by accident. And to be sure, um, select the class, um, so app.java in this case, containing your main method before you hit the run button. And if you want to be absolutely sure, select it, right click it, go to run as Java application, and then you're, you absolutely know what you're running. Otherwise, you can get quite confused quite easily. Um, also, by the way, you, you can, not only can you sort of contract projects like this, but you can right click them and close them like this, go to close project, and then you can open them again later when you want to. We're gonna look at this stuff more later on anyway. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so doubles. If you want a floating point value, you can't use the type int. So um, I can't write int, uh, what, what should we have here? Maybe height equals 1.8. So that, that's not going to work. We get a, an error here. And if I hover over the error, it says type mismatch cannot, cannot convert from double to int. So this is a what we call a literal value here. It's um, we can also say that it's hard coded. It's a value that I've actually coded into my computer program, a literal hard coded value. And uh, intrinsically, by default, it has the double type because it's got a point in it. We need to use the double type to, to store it. Uh, incidentally, in the USA um, and the UK and some other places, we use a point. So we say 1.8, that sort of thing, to indicate fractional values like 0.8. Um, large parts of Europe apparently use a comma, uh, so uh, but we don't do that in Java. As far as I know, all, all versions of Java are the same. We use a point to indicate a fractional value. Okay, so let's write here double. Now we've got something that will actually work. Now we've, we've only now we've we've just got a warning, um, which is saying that we're not using it, and we can output that out just as we did with integers. So um, let's say height is 
plus height. And let's try running that. There we go, height is 1.8. Um, we're going to uh, start doing some stuff with this, but I'm going to leave it there for this tutorial. Try that out. Check you can declare double values. You can always put more of them in the same program as long as you give them different names. Um, but do have a go at it. And uh, we're going to look later on also at some general tips that you should use when programming and some tips for following this course. But at the moment, I'm just concentrating on getting you started with the most important things. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video, we're going to take a look at arithmetic in Java. So we're gradually beginning to get towards writing something that really looks like a computer program and might actually be useful. Uh, so let's, let's delete this. This is a copy of the program. I was working on in the last video and um, we've, we've got um, in arithmetic obviously we've got well four operators that are very commonly used we've got uh, we've got plus plus operator these are called binary operators because they work on two values together you know like three plus four there's two values so it's a binary operator and the general name for these things is they're called operators. We've also got divide and in Java the symbol for divide is a slash like that. You have to get the right kind of slash. If you're going from left to right it's you'd have to go up, up a hill if you you imagine sort of I'm gesturing with my fingers which of course you can't see but it's like a hill sloping upwards from left to right. Um, we've also got um, multiply and in Java that's an asterisk and in fact these conventions are common in very many uh, programming languages and we have uh, subtract, subtract which is the normal sign you'd expect it's a short dash like that let's try these out a little bit so um, we'll have some variables um, in fact uh, you can just use sysouts maybe we should also just do that to start with and then we'll take a bit more of an extended look at this in the next video, I think. So if I write um, system.out.print line 7 plus 3, we expect to see 10. And of course we do see 10. There we go. We'll try some, try some other things. We'll try all of them. Um, so uh, if we try 9 divided by 3, we should see three. So we try this. So we say, it says three. Um, here's a surprise. Uh, if we do, let's say, 10 divided by three, we run this, we still get three. Why is that? Well, if you divide um, one integer by another integer, the remainder will be discarded. So you won't you won't get back a um, floating point value. You'll still get back an integer value. So, for example, five divided by two would be two because we're just dis discarding the remainder of one. Um, if you divide an integer by an integer, then the result will also be an integer. But you can use floating point values. So if I divide 10.0 by, let's say, well, let's say 3.0, then we'll get the answer that you might expect. 3.333 recurring. So you can see that with floating point values, it works. And it, you get a floating point answer, even if only one of your values is floating point. So for example, if we divide let's say, um, let's try dividing 9 by uh, 4.0. Let's try that. So if we do that, we should get, yeah, we get 2.25, two and a quarter. Um, so that, that works because one of the values is floating point, one floating point value gives floating 
point result. Now, what I've just done, what I'm actually doing here, which actually I should have mentioned, and I think I've maybe touched on it briefly, uh, I have, but um, if you write two forward slashes like this, everything else that you write on that line is a comment. Um, it's, it's very useful to write comments in your code, uh, but it, it's, it's better to use them to describe um, kind of what, you, what you're intending to do overall or what you've done overall. There's, there's not much point putting a comment saying output uh, 10 divided by 3 uh, because you, you should learn that you should learn that you should learn to understand that just from seeing this code and also if you write a comment and then you change the code and you don't change the comment you can seriously mislead yourself so comments are important but generally better saved for blocks of code where otherwise it wouldn't be clear what the intention of it is for that sort of thing we'll take another look at this at this uh, in a in a video shortly actually okay let's let's carry on with this so if I write sys out, um, uh, let's try. So we've got we've got plus, we've got divide. Um, let's try multiply. So three times four. Uh, we expect that to be twelve. There we go. It works. And of course subtraction. Uh, so let's let's do three minus four um, because that should give us minus one. And if we actually run this, we see that indeed we get minus one. So try all of those out for yourself and put some comments in as well, just to kind of describe what you're doing. Although they may, may be a bit overly precise, unnecessary at the moment, it's good to get into the habit of using comments a little bit. Try them all out and don't forget to try int integer division like this one and uh, assure yourself that it doesn't, it discards the remainder it doesn't work quite as you might otherwise expect. Okay, and try floating point division as well. You can try all of these with floating point and integers if you can be bothered. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this um, tutorial we're going to look at assigning values to variables. Uh, so I've written a comment here actually, and um, it's a multi-line comment. So if you want to have one line of comments like this, that's just text on one line, the next line wouldn't be a comment anymore. And that starts with two slashes, but you can also have multi-line comments with slash star and they end in star slash. These stars are just decorative. We don't actually need them. They just look nice, but uh, that's why Eclipse put them in. But this video is about assigning variables. So if you want to have comments on multiple lines, you can just enclose them with slash star and finish them with star slash. Okay, so let's declare some variables here. I'm going to have int dogs equals eight and int cats equals three. And we can output those values. So we can say dogs is that and the number of cats, we're going to have cats cats and if we run that we should see what we expect let's check so yes it says down here dogs eight cats three okay now we can change variables as we go along so underneath this so underneath the system.out.print lines underneath those let's set the number of dogs equal to the number of cats so I'm going to do that by saying dogs equals cats and we'll output them again. Let's try this and see what it does. So if I run this now, we see, we see that the, the number of dogs has been set to what the number of cats was set to, which is three. This can be very confusing for beginners. So to start with, we have eight stored in the variable dogs, and we have three, I should say I'll use the proper language, I've got three assigned to the variable cats. And later on, we say, this This is saying here, take whatever number is in cats and assign that value to the variable called dogs. And then we display them again. Remember, your, your program's working downwards. So it does this, it does this, 
then we output those values and then we're changing the value in dogs and then we're outputting the values again. Um, this looks perhaps confusing because it reminds people of an equation for one thing. It looks as though we're saying the number of dogs and the number of cats is the same. But that's not what we're doing here. This is um, assigning a value to the dogs variable. When we write a variable and we write equals and then some value, we assign a value to the variable. We're actually changing the value in this dogs variable using this assignment operator. Technically, it's not an equality operator. It's an assignment operator here, this equals. And the value that we're giving dogs is whatever value cats has. And that's three, because we assign the value three to it. So we end up with cats is unchanged, it's still three. And the number of dogs is eight by the time we run the program. Let's try this again. So there we go, they're both three. Now, these variables don't know about each other. They, they don't, it's not like they... The, it's not like the number of dogs is forever linked to the number of cats. So if I write here cats equals 10, what have I done now? Well, the value of cats was 3. I set the number of dogs to the number of cats. I set it to 3. Then I change the number of cats to 10. The number of dogs is still 3. So we should have dogs equals 3 and cats equals 10. Let's run this. And that's what we've got dogs 3 and cats 10. Uh, often uh, I want to output the values of variables multiple times as I go through my program. For example, when I'm debugging and I like to just put numbers on those. So here I could say 1 and this is 1 and let's say this is 2 and this is 2. Makes it just a little bit clearer, I think, what's going on. So it looks like this. Try that out for yourself. So declare some variables. You can have two, three, however many you like. Uh, display them. Try assigning new values to them. And try assigning the value in one variable to another. And display them again. And if you like, you can carry on. Change the values again. Output the values again in your console. It's really worth doing this. So you may be watching, thinking that you can just memorize this. And you can up to a point but you'll quickly lose the thread of what's happening if you don't practice. It's very important to practice this. Try it out practically. The more you do that, the better. Okay, so have a go at this yourself. Try declaring variables, outputting them, changing the values, outputting them again, and I'll catch you in the next video. Until then, happy coding. Hello, in this video, we're going to take a look at doing calculations. So um, let's say I've got some people and their average height is one point, let's say, six, seven meters. So double height equals 1.67. Now let's say I want to know, I've got seven of these people and they're, they're performing acrobats and they're going to all stand on each other's shoulders. And I want to know how high seven of them will be standing on each other's shoulders. So I could just write sys out height times 7. Or if I, if I like, I could write 7.0. Here it makes no difference. And if I run that, I find that the answer is 7 of them on top of each other are going to be 11.69 meters high. Now, what I could also do is I could write double, let's say, result equals height times 7. And then I could output the result. Let's run this and we should get the same, well, the same result. Okay. Uh, now, uh, there, there is one thing that beginners often tend to do, which is a bad idea, which is that beginners are liable to give variable names, really short letters like R. Occasionally that's appropriate. Uh, typically when you're using mathematical equations, and the convention is that you would use, for example, an X or a Y, then it makes sense to just use one letter. But most of the time, don't give variables one letter names because it gets very confusing. Another thing is, in general, don't give variables vague names. So here I've written result. What does that mean? It really tells me nothing. 
about um, what I'm actually doing here. So it would be better to give it a more specific name. Give it the most meaningful name that you can. You can also even use multiple words in your variables. So I could create a variable called total height. And what I do is by convention, uh, in the convention that Java usually uses, uh, the first word in your variable has a lowercase first letter. So the variable starts with a lowercase first letter. But any word after that has an uppercase first letter. So total height will be written like this. That makes it easy to read and it's also meaningful. So it, on, on, if, okay, if you don't know exactly what you're calculating, you're just kind of making something up to see how it goes, then it might make sense to write result here. But if you possibly can, give your variable a meaningful name. It's better to make it excessively long than to make it excessively cryptic by making it too short and too meaningless. It makes your programs a lot easier to read. Okay, so we're, we're here creating the total height of seven people stood on top of each other. Now, supposing they also have a flagpole. The height of the flagpole are defined in another variable. So like this, uh, double flagpole height, let's call it, equals, um, let's say the flagpole is two meters high. I'll write 2.0. And in fact, this height here, well, that's not very meaningful because now I've got multiple heights in my program. I want to change it so that um, we have this height and this height, wherever I've used height, I want it to say person height. Rather than do that by hand, since I've got multiple versions of it, I'm going to right click and I'm going to go to source and I'll go to um, no sorry I'm going to go to refactor so right click it go to refactor rename and type a new name so I'm going to type here person height and it, it corrects all of all of my variables that are called height it, it corrects the specific variable that I want to change okay so we've got the height of a person We've got a flagpole height. We're calculating the total height of seven people on top of each other. And I also want to add the height of the flagpole on top because I want to know how high the whole thing is. Seven people on top of each other and the top one is waving a flagpole, holding it presumably by the very end of it using his or her fingertips. Let's run this. I've got to save it first. And so this, this is what we originally have at 11.69. So if I add the flagpole height, we should get 13.69. Let's add that in. Plus flagpole. And to save me typing out the variable, I can hold down control and press space. And then it brings up a list of suggestions and I can hit return to select the first one. Okay, let's, let's run this. And now we get 13.69. One last thing I want to bring to your attention is that this looks ambiguous, this expression, because does it mean person height times seven and then add the flagpole height? Or does it mean person height times seven plus the flag flagpole height? So you could add seven to the flagpole height and then multiply the person height by that. Or you could add seven to person height and then add the flagpole height. There are things, there are rules called... Um, operator precedence rules, which we're going to talk about a bit. But for now, when you have an expression like this, and this is really good practice anyway, put round brackets in to make it less ambiguous. So if I put round brackets around this part, that makes it clear that I'm adding, multiplying the person height by seven. And after that, I'm adding the flagpole height. Hopefully you understand what I mean, because the other, the other thing that we could have done instead is I could add seven to the flagpole height and multiply the person height by that. But that gives us something else. It's not what we want in this case. Here we get 15.03. But what I want is to add the person height, mu sorry, multiply it by seven and then add the flagpole height. Let's run this. 
Okay, soon I'm going to give you an exercise with this, but there was a lot in that video. Um, so what I would recommend is that type this out yourself and run it and get it working and then make up your own little program. Think of something you could calculate, no matter how silly. Uh, we're, we're not standing on pride here. It's good to experiment with silly ideas. Think of something you could calculate and try to calculate it. And let's put a comment on here, in here, with two slashes. And I'm going to write, calculate height of seven people plus a flagpole. There we go. Okay, try that for yourself and then try to make up a little program that does a calculation and see how you get on. And until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video, video I'm going to give you some tips about programming uh, in general. Um, I'm going to give you an exercise soon and in the, in the next video actually we're probably going to look at um, some tips about how to get the most out of the course. But in this video, firstly, before all that, I'm going to just talk about programming in general a little bit. So I've got some tips here. We're going to look at these. So my first tip for programming, and th these really will help you a lot. This is ju not just idle chatter. These will help you a lot if you do them. So strive for great formatting and use auto format. So what you should do is when you're developing your code, let's open this. So when you're writing code, run the auto formatter regularly. So remember that's um, Command Shift F on the Mac. It's Control Shift F on Windows. And uh, you can alternately, although it takes longer, you can right click the file that you want to format and go to Source Format. All right, so run that all the time. Run this auto format because it's really important for the sake of understandability, readability, to keep your code well formatted. But equally, strive to write your code um, in a way that's well formatted to start with. And you'll know you've got it right because when you run the auto formatter, it won't change your code formatting. The auto formatter will be happy with what you've already written. So try to write your code so that it's formatted well in the first place. And if you get that right, when you run the auto formatter, it won't actually change your code, but keep running the auto formatter. Keep doing that. Um, try to get to a point where it doesn't have to do any work. That will really help you. If you can learn good formatting, you've avoided, you know, one of the worst beginner's mistakes uh, that causes so many problems. Bad formatting really causes, um, wastes a lot of time for beginners. So if you can get it right, you know, start getting it right to start, to start with, then that will give you a big, um, sort of helping hand. Google error messages. So if you make a mistake in your code, let's miss off a semicolon here. You'll get an error icon here and also if you try to run it, let's save it and run it, you'll get an error down here in the console. Unresolved compilation program. Syntax error, insert semicolon to complete statement at line 8. I can even click on this line and it takes me to the to the right line. Now here it's pretty obvious um, probably uh, what the what the message means. Um, well relatively obvious uh, it could still catch you out if you're a beginner. It's telling us to put a semicolon at the end of the line but often you'll get error messages that are quite cryptic and you don't understand them. Type those error messages into Google or the search engine of your choice and maybe add Java as well. And then you'll, you'll often see web pages that will be very helpful. They'll explain to you what mistake you've made. Um, and that's a lot quicker than having to, you know, you can ask questions in the course, but it's a lot faster if you can just get to the bottom of it yourself with a web search. So literally, what, whatever the error message says when you hover over the red icon or when you run your program, don't be afraid to type that into a search engine and uh, see what comes up. You might need to add Java as well uh, to get the right results and that will usually help you. It will help you to figure out what's actually gone wrong. Output values of variables. So when you're working through your program, let's take a look at this one here I think. Um, 
cut in system.out.print line and output the values of variables and put those in your code wherever you're not sure what the value of a variable is. So at this point, for example, um, I might I might be going to write more code further down that depends on total height. And I might want to check that this total height calculation actually works. So at that point, I can output the value of this variable total height and check that it is what I expect it to be. And that's something that um, all the programmers that I know pretty much use that all the time. They they put system.out.print line in their code to check that variables have the values they expect them to be at that point in the program. So you can output um, the same variable multiple times as you work down through more and more lines to check that at any point in your program it has the correct value. That's a really useful tip. You'll see me doing that as we go through the course. Write code a little bit at a time running frequently. So don't write a whole like page of code, like a big page bigger than this. Don't write a big chunk of code and without running it. So write your code in little bits and then output the values of important variables or just all your variables or whatever you like. Uh, and then run it, check that works. And then you can delete the system.out.print line if you don't need it and then add more code to it. So what I'm saying is don't write a big piece of code and only then run it. Write code a little bit at a time. Add code to your programs a little bit at a time. And after you've written a new bit, output the values of some variables so you can check that they are what you expect and run the program. So build up your program a little bit um, at a time. That will really help you. And you'll also see me doing this in this course, I think. Um, write the end of a pair of brackets or quotes before filling them in. This will make more sense to you later on. But if you've got something that comes in pairs in your program, like brackets are usually in pairs. So this is a pair of brackets here. That bracket is paired with that bracket. This square bracket is paired with that square bracket. And also this speech mark and this, they're a pair as well. So in general, I recommend when you write some opening pair of something, write the closing pair at the same time, then go in and fill in whatever's in the middle of them. You can do that with quotes and brackets. The point is to avoid the point is to avoid situations where you've written an opening quote or an opening bracket and forgotten the closing one. Uh, so you might want to come back to this video later on because this will make more sense to you later on. But keep everything in pairs, write the closing one soon after you've written the opening one. And finally, make sure you know what you're running. Because as a beginner, I often got confused. I'd have multiple projects open. I'd click a run button in my IDE and um, I'd run the wrong code. And then I'd be changing the code and I'd be looking at the output in the console and thinking, why, why, is, why aren't my changes having any effect? And it's simply that you're running the wrong program. You know, so I might be working on this program here, but I, um, you know, I click the run button and it runs, doesn't run that code, you know. So um, make sure you, you run the right thing. And to be doubly sure, so it helps to have the right code selected or the right project at least. I think that will probably, yeah, that changes what you're actually running. But if you want to be absolutely sure that you're running the right thing, select the file that has the main, your main method in it, right click it and go to, uh, go to source, no, sorry, where are we? Go to run as Java application. So um, I select something that I want to run. I right click it and I go to source, uh, sorry, I go to run as Java application. And after that, you can just use the run button, but it helps if the first time you run something, if you're not completely sure you're running the right thing, actually select it, right click it and go to run as Java application. And that, that will, that will help a lot because, um, you'll be, if you've got multiple projects open, it's really easy to get confused about what you're running versus what you're writing at the time.
That's it for this video. Um, you might want to come back to this later if you start finding programs getting really confusing. Uh, but I wanted to just run these tips past you to start with. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, before we go on to look at um, some worked examples of what we've seen so far, I've got just a few more tips for you and these, most of them relate to the course specifically. First of all, the source code. If you go to github.com slash cave of programming, uh, this is where I keep my public source code. Uh, so you, you can look at this, uh, look at whatever you want, but if you click on repositories and then go to find Java beginners 11 in the list, click on that, you can find here all the source code that we're working on. Um, so if I want to see this source code, I can actually browse it and see it here, which is helpful. Um, I notice that when, when I provide these repositories, um, some people want to download the whole thing and then build all the applications. I would recommend not doing that. You can do it if you want to. Um, but I would recommend not downloading it because you don't learn anything like that, really. Uh, what this is best used for is just consulting it um, if you've got something wrong somewhere and you can't figure out what it is. Uh, you, of course, you can look back at the video, but it's probably easier to look at this source code in many cases. So um, take, take a look at that, and if you keep it open while you work, then you can refer back to it. Uh, okay, so um, uh, a second um, thing that I'm going to say here is to get the most out of the course, always type out code and experiment with it. So you, c you can't learn programming just by watching videos. Um, it's like learning the piano or the violin or learning a human language for that matter. Um, if you just watch videos, y you aren't going to learn it. What you have to do is use the videos as a source of in inspiration and information. Type any code that I type in the videos. Make sure at some point you type it out yourself. And even better, try to think, how could you change that code without breaking the program? Try to make some meaningful change to it. Experiment with it. And the more you do that, the more you'll learn. You will find sometimes you'll create bugs and errors. Maybe you won't be able to fix them. But um, if you spend some time trying to figure out why your program doesn't work, even if you never actually figure out why that is at this stage, all the time you spend doing that, puzzling over it, will really help. Especially if, rather than just looking at it, you also experiment with it. Try outputting the values of variables. You know, try to try to experiment with it, kind of physically change the code, try to get it to work and to run. But the main thing here is type everything out and also experiment with it a little bit. Try to change it um, and still have it run in a meaningful way and do something useful. Uh, because you won't learn just by watching videos. Um, it's a practical skill like learning the piano. Uh, let's take a look at this one. So I would say focus on practice, not memorization or notes. And the reason that I say this is because I've seen beginners try to learn programming by, like they have a lesson or they watch some videos and they make endless notes on it or they try to, they, they really strain their brains trying to memorize everything. And um, I would say that's not an effective way to learn. The effective way to learn is to practice. Think of it just like learning the guitar or whatever. You've got to practice. Practice is the key to it. So don't worry too much about memorizing things. Don't worry too much about making notes, but practice everything. So everything that you want to learn, you have to actually try it out yourself. Check that it works. Experiment with it a little bit. If you do that enough, you will learn programming bit by bit. You may sometimes feel very puzzled, but eventually you'll get the hang of it. And it's really a question of how much time you spend doing that. You have to practice. Uh, and it, uh, a, lot, a lot of practice is going to be needed. But the good news is that after a certain point, programming tends to be addictive. People tend to get addicted to it and time flies by. Not everyone has that experience, but many people do. That you start writing programs and when you reach a certain level of fluency, um, you, you get into a state of mind where you're just curious and you think, 
well, I could add, I could add this new feature to this program, see if that works. And it becomes an addictive process for many people. And that can really help with the practice. If you're addicted to something, of course, you'll practice it a lot. Don't forget to go outside, though, you know, and take breaks. Don't screw yourself up with programming. But um, practice is the key. And finally, uh, this is optional. Learn to touch type. Touch typing means being able to type um, on your keyboard without looking at the keyboard. Now, I think only about half of all programmers for a guess have this skill. And the others do what we call hunting and pecking. They hunt and peck. So they keep looking down at their keyboard. They use one, two, three, however many fingers. And they just type the um, characters one by one. That's fine. It's totally fine. But if you want to learn even faster, then learn to touch type. You can find free touch typing programs on the internet. If I search for free touch typing, um, you can find various links here to, to programs online that you use on the internet that teach you to touch type. And it's actually not that hard to learn to touch type. Probably most people can do it um, in a few weeks or less, especially if you start touch typing your emails. It's difficult at first to make the transition from hunting and pecking to touch typing, but um, you can learn this quite, quite, quite quickly. And when you've learnt it, your typing speed will increase a lot. Now, although typing speed isn't a big deal in programming, um, you can type slowly and you know, you're still gonna you're still gonna be writing programs. Uh, programming is not primarily about typing speed, it's not so important. But a major reason that people get discouraged with programming is they just feel it's taking them too long and too much effort to write code. So they avoid writing code. And you can learn a lot more effectively if you touch type for this reason, in my opinion. You can learn faster because you're less discouraged from writing code. You don't think, well, how long will it take me to type out total height or, you know, how long? You don't think like that. Instead, you think and your fingers do the typing, more or less. So touch typing can help make you less reluctant to type code. And by doing that, it makes it easier to learn coding. Nevertheless, that is optional. And probably half of all programmers, something like that, they just hunt and peck. They don't learn touch typing. So it's up to you. Okay. So until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video, we're going to take a look at um, a worked example of converting temperature in Celsius to Fahrenheit. So uh, generally these days in the UK, we use uh, Celsius to measure temperature. So we consider room temperature to be about 21. Whereas in the USA, uh, as far as I know, Fahrenheit is used. And, um, well, what we're going to do is convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. So, um, I would suggest pausing the video at this point and having a go at it yourself. Uh, if you go to Google and you type something like convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, then, um, you can find a formula for how to do it. So what this is telling us is that you take the temperature in Fahrenheit, subtract 32 from it, then you've got to take that and multiply it by 5 divided by 9. But don't forget that you can't divide one integer by another in Java, or rather you can, but it discards the remainder, so you want to use doubles there. Okay, so pause the video and have a go at that yourself. If you find yourself... Uh, sort of struggling a bit. That's actually good. You know, it's obviously it's great if you can just write the program But if it takes you a little while and you have to think about it That's good because all the while you're looking at this program and typing stuff and trying to get it to work You're learning. So, okay uh, Pause the video now All right, so hopefully you had a go at that Let's see how to do this so um, I'll zoom out here and then here. The first thing to do is we'll declare our temperature in Fahrenheit. So double Fahrenheit. Um, and let's set it to some temperature to start with. So let's say we want to convert 91 Fahrenheit to a temperature in Celsius. I don't know what that is. I have a feeling it's quite hot. We'll see. 
Uh, let's also have a variable for storing uh, Celsius. So let's say double Celsius. And what's Celsius going to be assigned? What value will we assign it? Well, we're going to take the temperature in Fahrenheit and we're going to subtract 32 from it. Now, in order to make sure that we do the calculations in the right order here, let's put that in round brackets because that's, that's the first thing we want to do. We want to take temperature in Fahrenheit, subtract 32, and then we're going to work with that. The next thing we want to do is we want, want to multiply that by 5 divided by 9. So let's do that. Let's multiply it, so that's an asterisk, by, and we can't say 5 divided by 9. That would be integer division. It would discard the remainder. So in this case, that will give us 0. But we can say 5.0 divided by 9, or we can also say 5.0 divided by 9.0, or 5 divided by 9.0. As long as there's a, there's a double in there, we get double division. That should do the trick. So now we can type sys out, and um, let's write temperature. Well, actually, let's write the whole thing out. Let's say... Um, Faren height, and I'm going to add to that some text, concatenate some text. Um, Fahrenheit, uh, let's say, so this is going to say, that. that's going to say so far, like, for example, 91. So let's say 91 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that should have a capital F. Not on the variables because they have to have a lowercase first letter. So 91 degrees Fahrenheit is plus um, Celsius plus degrees Celsius. Let's run that. I think I had the street cleaner running past, so sorry about the noise. We'll try running this. And there we've got 91 degrees Fahrenheit is 32.7778 degrees Celsius. So uh, by British standards, at least, that's very hot. A temperature we rarely encounter, in fact. So what have I done here? Um, well, you see that I've, I basically just join numbers and text together. And when I, when I join the text to the number, I started off, so inside the double quotes here, I started off with a space, and that, that gives us this nice space here. Uh, so after is, we've also got a space, and that's, that's this space here. And um, so then we've got the temperature in Celsius, and we've got finally some more text to finish it off. And we've got a space there as well. So the whole thing comes out nicely spaced. One thing that isn't good is that we've got a lot of digits here. And we're going to look at how to deal with that in the next section when we take a look at strings and text. Um, I don't think there's anything else to say about this. Uh, it's, it should be fairly straightforward, but if you found it confusing, you couldn't do it, whatever, don't worry too much. But if you couldn't do the exercise, definitely type this out yourself and... Um, Try playing around with it a bit, you know, see if you can change the formatting or whatever. If there's anything in it that bothers you, try to guess how it works and maybe make changes and see if your changes work as you expect. You know, just but definitely type it out, whatever you do, unless you successfully wrote the program. OK, we'll leave it there for now. And until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this section of the course we're going to take a bit of a look at strings and then after that we'll be able to get on to um, actually doing loops and things like that so it will start to look more like a real computer program. Uh, strings are, um, are used for dealing with text basically. So it's, it's the, name, the word string uh, in programming lingo means some text. Uh, it's like a string of letters you could say. Let me show you a, a slightly quick way of creating a new project first. So I'm going to go to File, 
new Java project. I'm going to fill in a name. Let's call it strings. And I'm just going to click finish straight away. Uh, so the Java version is set to my default anyway. And that's what I want. I click finish. Because we're using Java 11 here, it asks me if I want to create a module. And we're not going to use that for the moment. So I'll click don't create. And there we've got our project. So I can do the same as usual. Right click, go to new class, call it app. Put it in a package, which I'll make up a name for. I'll call it application, as usual. And tick to say that I want public static void main finish. Okay, so we just missed out one screen, but it's a slight time saver. So we've seen that you can write things like int um, yeah, cats equals seven, or we could write double height equals, um, I am. 5.3. So uh, these are just variable names that we make up and these are primitive data types int and double used for storing uh, whole numbers and floating point numbers respectively. Both of them can store positive or negative values and they both have a sort of minimum, minimum or maximum value that you can store using them and you can find out what that is if you just search for Java primitive data types and look at that page. What if we want to use text? With text, um, we use a variable type called string. And this has a capital, um, f has an uppercase, first case, it has an uppercase, first letter. Let's say string, and I'll call it name. So again, this is just the name of a variable. I'm just making it up. I'm calling it name. And I'm going to set, I'm going to assign that the value. Um, John, because that's my name. Uh, so let's let's get rid of these. Uh, why does string have an uppercase first letter here instead of lowercase? Well, the answer is string is not a primitive data type. It's actually a thing in Java that we call a class. Um, and in that respect, it's similar to app. App is a class we're creating ourselves. String is a standard class that's part of uh, the Java API or application programming interface. It's part of Java, essentially. So uh, string is a class and it's, it's a variable type here. So it's a type of variable string. All right, so we can output that with sys sysout, system.out.println. Let's output name. And let's just run that. And it says John, as you might expect. There are lots of things that we can do with strings and we'll start looking at those in the next video. Until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're going to take a look at a few things you can do with strings in Java. So uh, let's create a string for a start. Let's say string name equals John and um, We've, we've already seen that you can display this. So if I just type sysout name, we can we could display that string. We can also um, join strings together. So uh, in sysout here, I could do this. My name is, let's put a space in and then a plus. What, so what's this actually doing? Well, um, here we've got a, a string variable, a variable of the string type, and we're assigning it this string value. So this text in quotes is called a string literal. It's, um, it is a string itself, and that's why we can assign it to a variable of type string, which is effectively also a string. So this is a string, and this is a variable that's capable of referring to a string. Now, um, when we were looking at primitive variables, I said that a primitive variable is a bit like a bucket that you put a label on and you put some value into that bucket. Um, this isn't a primitive uh, type of variable because string is not a primitive type. It's what we call a class in Java. So this works a little bit differently. Um, this This is a bit like it's a bit like um, like if you write down an, an address on a piece of paper. 
what you know the address of a house what is that thing that you've written it's a, it's a kind of an instruction for where you can find a particular house and with non primitive variable types that's uh, similar to what you get so by assigning a value to this name variable it's as if we're we're telling name to remember where this string literal is so this is what actually creates the string and this assignment operation here is saying uh, make name uh, kind of store the location of this string so you can find it again and there we're actually using it and we're using name to refer to this existing string don't worry too much about that uh, it'll become clearer to you as we go through the course what we're doing here is we're taking a string literal and we're joining it or concatenating it with another string so when we uh, run this program it says my name is John uh, we could also put that we could also make well we could define a variable declare a variable I should say I'm trying to use the exact right language here we could de declare a variable that refers to a string literal like this so let's do that let's say string um, text I'll just call it text so I'm just making up names for my strings here equals uh, let's let's do something a little bit different I'm gonna write I am called all right so I've made I've declared this variable of type string and I've assigned it the value of, of this string literal so really I'm I'm telling it to refer I'm making it refer to this string literal here which is just some text it's a, str it's a string and let's do sys out like this and then I'm gonna write text plus name so here I'm joining uh, two strings together essentially I'm joining um, this this variable with this variable so really what I'm doing is I'm joining this string literal with this string literal yeah because I'm joining that with that okay uh, let's run this and we will see that it works I am called John and you can join multiple strings together for example um, I could define another string here uh, let's call it um, end of end of sentence so here I've got um, a variable name that's made up of multiple words and I'm following the convention as usual the first letter is lowercase and we uppercase the first letter of each subsequent word I'm going to set that equal just simply to a full stop like that and then in my system.out.print line I can add on end of sentence and here to save me typing I'm going to type the first bit and then press control and then space so control and space at the same time and hit return to select the first option and it auto completes for me okay let's run this and you see that we've got a full stop on the end so we've concatenated three strings together here um, try that for yourself try try this little program and check you can get it working and then try to make up some combination of strings and just output them yourself so make up some program that involves let's say three strings and join them together and output them something like that make something up Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're going to take a look at control characters in strings. So let's define a string. Um, so I'm going to write here string, I'll call it text. I'm giving it a generic name because I don't really know what it's going to be exactly. But I'll write some text here. Um, what should we write? To be or not to be that is the question all right so we've got two sentences here and we can output that sys out uh, and output text so let's run this and we've got the output as we expect now uh, within strings um, because 
they are simply just text. You can use um, more or less any character you want to use. Uh, almost any character that you might feel like using is valid in there. It's just ordinary text. But um, we can put control characters in there. Uh, so all of the characters we've got in here are printing characters. Uh, well, in a way, even the spaces. I'm not sure how technically how it's classified, but the point is that they all um, they all visibly display uh, in in your output. So the letter B visibly displays as it is. Uh, the space, um, well, that just creates space. So I guess it's a non-printing character. Uh, anyway, let's not worry about that. But um, the rest all, all visibly display. But there are non-printing characters. And these are things that alter the formatting of your string. So they don't actually display themselves. They alter uh, the position of it somehow. And probably the most commonly used one is the new line character. So the, the non-printing characters or control characters start with a backslash. So backslash n means new line. So at the point where I have this, we're going to create a new line. In other words, we're going to see that these two sentences are now on two separate lines. And we don't want that space anymore because um, we don't want to start a new line with a space or whatever. Let's run this. And you can see we've got that on two separate lines now. Another really common character um, that you might want to use is tab. So um, let's let's indent the first line with a tab. So you can put it anywhere in your string, uh, but we'll we'll put it at the beginning here. Let's write slash t. That gives us a tab character. So when we run this program, we can see that the first sentence has been indented by one tab. We'll put another one in because this looks ugly. Let's at least line them up. So directly after the new line, I'm going to write slash t. So we've got a new line here, followed by a tab character. And if we run this, now they're both tabbed in one tab. If you actually, for some reason, want a slash in your, um, in your string, uh, because slash normally starts a control character, you can't just write slash in there. It will think I mean backslash O, it will think that must be some weird control character, so we get an error. I don't think backslash O is a control character, or if it is, I haven't used it. But anyway, uh, it's not valid to just put a slash in by itself. If you actually want a slash in there, you have to write two slashes, and then it works. So here we've got to be slash or not to be. Okay, anyway, let's get rid of that. That's that's not something you usually use because you don't normally need slashes in your string. Okay, now I'm going to give you a little challenge. Let's write this in a comment. So I'm going to put slash star, it's a multi-line comment, and it ends in slash star. And this star is purely decorative. It doesn't have to be there. It just makes it look nicer. So let's imagine that we want to output some text on the console that looks like this. So it's indented by, let's say, a, a tab. And it says, select an option, colon. And then indented a little bit more underneath that, we're going to say um, one. Um, uh, what should we say? Uh, add an entry. To uh, view the database or three exit. So look at this bit of text, forget about the asterisks, they're just there for decoration or because they're part of the comment. How would you output this text on the command line? So you've got four lines here and three of them, uh, the first one is indented uh, one tab and the others, let's say, they're going to be indented two tabs. So they're indented one tab relative to the first line. Have a go at that yourself. It's up to you how you do it, whether you store these lines just in one variable, which is easiest, or you put the numbers in there separately or whatever. 
that's uh, I'll leave that up to you. If you want um, a particular, particularly challenging task, store the numbers separately. So one, two, and three, store those in integer type variables and store the rest in strings. Okay, have a go at that task. Try to write a program that outputs this on the command line. And if you can't do it, don't despair. We'll take a look at it in the next video. Hello, in this video, we're going to work through a possible solution to the exercise I gave you in the last video. Do watch this video even if you successfully did the exercise because I'm going to make a few remarks here. Um, if you've managed to output this text by any means at all, then basically you've, you've done the exercise and uh, you've solved the problem. Uh, if you couldn't manage to do it, then um, maybe watch this video and, and try again. Try to get that working. You should be able to do this, especially you might need to watch the previous video again, but you should be able to manage it. Okay, so I'm going to store all the text here in strings. So the first one, let's call it prompt and set it equal to select an option. And then we'll have also a string option one equals add an entry. Now you can use numbers in variable names, like I've used one here. You just can't put them at the start of a variable. So putting them at the start of the variable gives you an error, but you can use them at other positions in your variable. And we'll have two more of those, which I'll call option two and option three. Option two is going to be view the database and option three is going to be exit. We'll also have some numbers in here. Just we'll separate those out just to make it as complicated as possible. Uh, let's call this value one and set it equal to one. Uh, notice that this is a number and we're, we're assigning it to a variable of type int, which is an integer. If I had a one in double quotes like that, so this gives us an error because here we'd need type string because this is text. So whatever you put in quotes, it doesn't matter even if it's digits and it looks like a number. It's not a number, it's some text. So stuff in quotes is treated as text. Uh, whereas this without the quotes is, is a number. And those things are different. Numbers and text are treated differently in Java. So it doesn't matter if you've got text that just looks like a number. It's not number. It's not a number here. It's text because it's in quotes. Anyway, we'll get rid of those and um, we'll copy this and we'll have another two of them. So value one, two, three, two, three. So we could just output those. Um, we could also store them in another string. Let's call it menu. Uh, so what do we have? We, we have prompt and then we've got option, we've got value one and then we've got option one. Um, I, I could just type these out in a, in a massive long line. I could add them all together, but I'm going to do something slightly different. Uh, let's, let's in fact start this off as just being an empty string. All right. And then we're going to say menu plus equals. What does plus equal do? Well, um, this um, is the same as writing menu equals menu plus this other stuff. Um, so in the context of a string, what plus equals does is it takes the existing string, whatever's already in it, which here is nothing, and then it adds more stuff onto it. So um, by this means we can build up the menu without having a hugely long line. We're going to see another way of doing this later on. But for here, let's carry on like this. In fact, let's, let's set this initially equal to prompt. And then I can add on the values and the options. And what I'm striving for here is I'm striving for elegance. I'm trying to make this look beautiful because I want it to be clear and easy to read. I want it to be very logical so I can see what's happening here. The more beautiful your program is in general, 
um, the easier it is to modify it and remember what it's actually doing and that sort of thing. Let's try outputting that. So at each stage I'm using plus equals to add more text to the existing string. It starts off as prompt and then it's prompt plus um, one add an entry. Yeah, there we go. Then it's uh, we take that string and we do plus equals and then join this on. So we're using plus equals to keep we keep adding more text to the menu. So if we output that, what's it look like? Terrible because it's all on one line. There's no tabs or anything. Let's add in some tabs. So um, to do that, we could just we could just put them literally in in here. That would work or here. Let's try it. So here I'm going to say I'm going to put it in double quotes slash t plus. Do I need anything else? Um, I don't think I do at that point. Uh, so the others are going to start with two slash t's. So I'm going to have slash t slash t plus. And we also actually want a dot and a space after the option. So I need to add that in as well. So let's put that here, dot space plus. Okay, so it looks like this. Let's go through and add all of these in. So I'm going to copy that and paste it. I'm trying to use as few keystrokes as possible as well because uh, it saves typing. Let's run that and still not working because we, we need the new line. It looks better though. So let's add in some new lines. Let's say here plus slash n. I need double quotes there. All right, um, and I need to add these to the end of every line. So now I finally I run this and I've got my menu here. Okay, so now this is really a horrible program. I would never normally write a program like that. It's the best we can do um, if we, on the one hand, divide everything up, putting everything into separate variables, but on the other hand, uh, we stick to things that we've seen so far. We don't use programming constructs that we haven't seen yet. Um, but uh, with some more knowledge, we could reduce this down to a much smaller program uh, and at the very least a more elegant program that doesn't have all this repetition in it. There's a lot of repetition in here which we could eliminate and we're going to see how to do that in a future tutorial. So if you did something that output this text correctly um, and give yourself a pat on the back. If you did something horrendously complex like this, then that's amazing. That's really wonderful. Um, if you didn't, then I'd suggest typing this out. Try typing it out for yourself to see what it does. You can even output the menu like here before you've completed making it so you can see what that does. So if I run this, so now I should have two menus. So I've got this menu fragment at this point, and then I carried on adding two more options to it. And I create this second menu, which I output here. Okay, so try typing this out, if you can be bothered at least. I know it's a bit verbose. And see what it does. Maybe experiment with it. Check that you understand this. Check you understand the idea of adding more text onto an existing string. Okay. So we're going to go on to look at some things that would make this a lot more elegant and have a lot less duplication in it. But we'll leave it there for the moment. So until next time, happy coding. Hello. In this video, we're going to continue looking at format specifiers and I'll show you um, an answer to the last exercise that we looked at. So the exercise was to change this to have nicer output. So we don't want it to say um, 32.777, we want maybe one or two decimal places there. Uh, let's, let's maybe get rid of this because I don't think we're going to need it. These are some examples from the last video of using printf and format specifiers. So to change this so that it outputs Celsius to two decimal places, the first step is to change this to printf. Now, if you tried to do the exercise from the last video and you couldn't do it, 
feel free to pause this video at any moment and then try to do it when you feel you've got enough hints of how to do it. Okay, so I'm changing this to printf and then because I want a new line at the end, I'm going to put a backslash n in it. Although that doesn't make any visible difference here because I've only got one line being output. So if I change this to printf, you can't tell that it's there's no new line at the end of it because there's only one line anyway. But let's put that in in case we output more lines. So I'm going to put backslash n at the end there. And that doesn't look any different so far. Okay, um, so instead of putting Celsius here, instead of concatenating it into the string, I'm going to just have one string and I'm going to put percent %f in it. And then after, so then um, this is one complete argument to printf. It's, it's one single string because I'm concatenating this string, sorry, this double value, uh, or yeah, it's double value. I'm concate concatenating that with this string to make one single string. So now I'm going to put a comma in and I'm going to supply a second argument. The second argument is going to be the value in Celsius, converted value. So that's going to be substituted into this percent %f here. Let's run it. Okay, so now it looks how it did originally, but the value of doing this is that we can now specify how many decimal places we want. So we can say percent, let's say 0.1, I'll just have one decimal place, percent 0.1 f. And if we run that now, it looks a lot nicer. In fact, it looks like it's even rounded up the value to 32.8, which is great. Um, I could also do that with Fahrenheit, so I could get rid of this concatenation here. And here I could, at the start, I could put percent, um, yeah, let's say 0.1 again, percent 0.1 F. So now the first format specifier is the, the value in Fahrenheit. So that's going to be my first argument after this argument, so the second argument. I'm going to write Fahrenheit. And then the third argument is Celsius, and it's going to replace this. So that they're replacing these uh, these arguments here, second and third arguments to this printf method, are replacing the format specifiers in order. You know, so first first one is Fahrenheit, second one is Celsius. Okay, let's run that. And well, it looks great. Ninety one point zero degrees Fahrenheit is thirty two point eight degrees Celsius. Hopefully that's correct. Um, I'm just wondering whether I should put anything else in this video. There are other things uh, I can tell you here. Um, we'll, we'll perhaps leave it there for this video. Try that out yourself and get it working and uh, see how it looks. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're going to take a look at getting input from the user. So we're going to take an important step and actually make our program interactive. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to use a class called Scanner. So at the moment you still don't really know what a class is, but um, we, do have, um, we do have at least one, well we have a couple of examples of classes here. We've got App, and that's a class that we're creating ourselves. We've set here public class app, we've created an app. And we've also got a system here. Um, and we can recognize these because they have uppercase first letters. These are actually classes. And you'll find out what a class is later on. We're going to use another class in this video called Scanner. So I'm going to write something that's going to look quite cryptic. But if you type it out a few times, you'll get used to using it. And you'll gradually come to understand it as you go through the course, as with many other things. So after the opening curly bracket of this main method, I'm going to put a couple of blank lines and I'm going to write scanner with an uppercase S, scanner with a lowercase S, equals new scanner, two round brackets and a semicolon. It's the capitalization is very important here. You have to get it right. And between these two round brackets, I'm going to type system, capital S, dot in. 
and we've still got an error at the moment. Now that's because I'm using this scanner class, which is part of Java. It's part of the JDK, Java Development Kit, but it's in a it's in a package, and um, my program doesn't know how to find this package. So to tell it where to find scanner, I'm going to um, use a shortcut key. So on the Mac, I'm going to do Command Shift O, or on the Windows, Control Shift O. Um, so uh, I hold down, if I was on Windows, I'd hold down Control and press Shift on Mac, Command and Shift, and then press O, the letter O. O stands for Organize Imports, and it brings up this dialog box. And I'm going to select this java.util.scanner and click Finish. And what that does is, all it does is it adds this line at the top of my program after the package statement. It adds import java.util.scanner. And that's saying, uh, when we say scanner in the program, we mean this scanner, and we're going to use this scanner. And it's in the java.util package. So this, uh, what a package is and a class will become clearer to you in time. For, for the moment, I'm just kind of trying to get used to the terminology. Let's take a closer look at this line. Looks a bit cryptic. Scanner here is a class, and we can recognize it because it has an uppercase first letter, an S. Uh, so let me give you a, a little question here. We're already um, working with two other classes in this one program. And maybe try to maybe pause the video if you feel like it and see if you can figure out where those two other classes are that we're using for, on the basis of what I've just said. Okay, so now maybe you found, found them or maybe you don't want to pause the video, but I'm going to tell you. So we're defining a class of our own here called app, and that's got a first uppercase first letter. And we're also using the system class here. And we're using the system class here. It's the same class. So there's, there's two that I can see already here. Um, this here is a variable. It's a variable of type scanner. Now, I've given it, I've also called it scanner. I've given it the same name as the scanner class, but with a lowercase first letter. Some people don't like to do that. They may even argue that this is bad practice to give a variable the same name as its type. So both are called scanner in this case. I'm a fan of it. I think it makes it clearer what this actually is. And I don't mind that they only differ by capitalization. But if you want, you can call it something different like, you know, um, scan input. Or some people even call it, call it input. Um, but I find that a bit confusing here because um, it's not actually input. It's a thing that's used for getting input. And what we do then is... We want to set it to a new, we call this an object, but we're, we're setting it to, to a new instance of scanner. So a class is kind of like a template, and an object is like a, a particular object made from that template. So we're creating a new scanner object here, and that will become clearer also later on. Don't worry about it now. But it's as if scanner is a blueprint or a recipe for making something, maybe more like a blueprint. And um, here, we're actually creating a particular instance of that thing. Like if we had plans for making a car um, here in the form of a class, and we have a particular car, we create a particular actual car by doing new here. And then we're saying that scanner is going to scan uh, the system input, system.in, and that's going to be input from the console. Okay, let's actually make this work. So what we have to do is... I'm going to say, um, underneath this, I'm going to say, let's maybe have another blank line and write sys, sys out. Um, enter value in Fahrenheit to convert. And let's put like um, uh, one of these characters, a sort of um, angle bracket pointing to the right to make it a bit more like a prompt. Maybe I'll have a I'll have a space there as well, and I'll also change this from print line to just print. So hopefully the user can type directly after this space. We'll see how this works. Um, 
so if I run this now, it, it simply outputs uh, some text. And in fact, the result is on the same line, so it even looks a bit ugly. But after this, immediately after the system.out.print, I'm going to write, um, let's write, well, let's actually, let's change this double Fahrenheit. So I'll move it up slightly. And instead of saying equals 91, I'll say equals scanner dot next float. And, and as soon as I see the right thing selected in this autocomplete, I think I press control space um, sort of instinctively. So you type a few characters, press control space, and this thing comes up. You get S gets rid of it. So what I want is next float, hit return, and semicolon. Let's try that. So um, I'm going to run it. And in the console, it says enter value in Fahrenheit to convert. I'm going to convert 97, very hot. Hit return. And um, we get 97.0 degrees Fahrenheit is 36.1 degrees Celsius. Uh, what happens if you enter something that isn't, um, isn't a floating point value? Let's run it. Well, it's fine with integers. If I write 54 or something, it works. It can easily convert an int to a float, just treat it like a float. But supposing we run it and I enter something that's not even a number, like some random text, we get an error. And in the next video, we're going to look a little bit at that error. So um, for now, try this out for yourself. And if you're feeling creative, even better, make up your own program. For example, make up a program to convert miles to kilometers, something like that. You can find a formula for it here. To convert miles to, miles to kilometers, you just multiply the number of miles by 1.609. So you could write a program that asks the user for a number of miles and converts it to a number of kilometers. Um, and it will work very much like this. Uh, maybe have a go at that and uh, type this out for yourself, I would suggest, first. Or just launch into trying to create a program very similar to this one that converts something to something else, but also gets input from the user. Okay, I'll leave it there for this video. Until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video we're just going to take a little bit of a look at um, the error message that we produced in the last video. So hopefully by now you've at the very least um, typed out this code yourself. And uh, I, would, I would strongly suggest at the very least experimenting with this, uh, see what you can change, you know, to uh, make it do something slightly different, see if it works as you expect. And ideally you've written some program that, con that gets user input and converts one number in one unit of measurement to some unit, some other number in some other unit of measurement or you've invented some exercise for yourself that's similar. Hopefully you've had a go at that, maybe converted miles to kilometers. And you shouldn't really encounter any great problems with that. Miles to kilometers would be basically the same program uh, as far as I can see, except that um, we don't need to subtract anything. We'd just be multiplying it by something. I think it was 1.609. Okay, so I just want to show you this thing that's appeared in in the console. If I run this and I enter something that isn't a number, hit return, then uh, we get this error trace. This is actually called a stack trace. Um, and the stack is basically how Java keeps track of um, one method calling another method. In other words, one method runs and it uses other methods, so other subroutines and uh, they sort of all make each other execute in a kind of a, well, kind of a tree type thing, really. Um, but uh, let's not worry about that for the moment, because we're getting a bit ahead of, uh, ahead of ourselves, really. I just want to begin to familiarize you with this, because you're going to see a lot of these, and it looks very intimidating to start with. When you get errors in Java, uh, they, they can look quite disturbing. So, um, one thing to say is, uh, regarding this program, I don't think there's any, there's not really any way we can fix it at the moment using what we already know at this point. 
so that it can handle uh, input that's not a number in a way that's more elegant. We totally can fix that, just not with what we know so far, as far as I can see, or not easily. So um, we're not going to worry about it for the moment. We'll look at it later on, how we would fix this sort of thing. But when you see an error message like this, very often the first and the last lines are the most important. Uh, so if we look at the top, it tells us what the basic problem is. The problem is we've got a Java util dot input mismatch exception. Now this is that input mismatch exception is actually a class. And what we have here is this is showing you that we say that an exception has been thrown and we'll be looking at that later on. But you could guess from the name of it, input mismatch exception, that there's some sort of mismatch with the input that we've entered, which is of course the case. We entered letters when it was expecting a floating point number. The last line in this case actually gives us the error. It gives us the line and the file uh, where the error occurred. So um, with really big stack traces, something that you can end up doing is sort of looking down them for the first line that it mentions uh, that's actually in your own code that you've actually written. You know, so you end up starting from the top and you're looking down it and you're looking at files that you haven't written yourself and eventually you come to one that you have written yourself and that's where you can start investigating the error. In this case, uh, there's only one line referring to our own code and it's right at the bottom and it's here at .java line 13 so if I click on that it will actually take me to the line there we go it's highlighted it and that is where the error occurred so we did scanner.next float and that was expecting the user to, to input a float but the user me in this case inputted some letters so it threw a wobbly it threw an exception in fact technically speaking. Wobbly is not a technical term. Okay, um, we've also got a warning here in this program and if we click on it it says resource leak scanner is never closed. Now that's not a big problem but we shouldn't leave warnings in our programs. Uh, what, it, what it means is well it wants me to all it wants me to do is what I'm about to show you which is uh, this. Let's create a um, new line in our program. In fact, I can do this immediately after I've used the scanner since I'm not going to use it again for anything. By this point in the program, line 14 here, I've, I've, I've just created a new blank line of course, but I'm not using the scanner anymore. So I can write scanner.close and then the warning goes away and that makes it happy. So what scanner.close does precisely, I'm not completely sure, but um, I don't think it's important, it's not that important, but um, it will make the warning go away. So I advise you to do it. Uh, closing things that we've opened in general is, in general is very important in programming. Uh, in this particular case, perhaps not so important, but in general, it's a good thing to do. And what we're closing, I suppose, is, is where we've got something that's scanning user input, trying to get user input and scanning it and trying to find out what's in it. That's what scanner does. It, in this case, it's scanning system.in, trying to get stuff from sister in, uh, system.in, and it's trying to turn it, it's, it's looking for a number in that user input, basically, and it didn't find one. And by closing it, I suppose we're, we're closing, I guess, system.in, I'm not really sure, but it, it doesn't matter. Okay, um, so we know where the error is. We can't fix it at the moment. We know that if you enter letters instead of a number, it throws an exception. And we're going to be looking at exceptions later on. But for now, uh, we'll, we'll just leave it as it is. Let's try it again now and check that it works. There we go, still working. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello. Um, we're going to finish this section by, I'm, I'm just going to show you some Eclipse tips and tricks, a few things you can do with Eclipse. So hopefully you've created that last program, you've got it all working, you put in the scanner.close and, um, or maybe you've created a similar program of your own. There are lots of other things that we can do with strings and we're going to be seeing more of them in the course, but 
rather than overload you with a massive list of everything you can possibly do with a string, I'm going to introduce them more, try, try to introduce them more sort of organically as we go through the course. And what I'm going to show you in this video is uh, just a few Eclipse tips and tricks. So one thing you can do in Eclipse is um, I'm using the dark theme here, which in this version of Eclipse seemed to be the default, and I sort of decided just to go with it. Um, but the default used to be uh, the light theme, but you can switch between them and select which one you prefer. So if you go to Eclipse Preferences, uh, so maybe that menu is different on Windows. I'm not completely sure. It might be in File or something. Uh, on the Mac, I get a particular menu called Eclipse. But regardless, however you usually go to the preferences uh, in programs in your operating system, go to that. You should be able to find the, the sort of Eclipse preferences somewhere. And in this dialog, if I type Theme and just click Appearance here, so um, I've got theming enabled and the dark theme is selected. If I want, I can select the light theme. And uh, I'm going to click Apply and Close. Whoa. And then I'm going to restart Eclipse because otherwise um, the sort of the change from one theme to another might not exactly be complete. So I'm going to restart it. So there are a few built-in themes, and you can find many more on the internet. Uh, so that's that's completely up to you. You can get Eclipse to look sort of more how you want it to look. Here we go. So it's very light now. I'll use this for the rest of this video, although it's hurting my eyes, um, because um, I want to show you some things that don't seem to work. One of them doesn't work too well in a dark theme. Something else I want to show you is... Um, working sets. So you see we've got a lot of programs uh, open here, a lot of projects I should say. It's becoming a bit cluttered and I can make that more manageable using working sets. So this worked fine in the dark theme when I tried it. But if you look at the package explorer on the left here, and if it's not showing you can go to Windows, Show View and Package Explorer. Sometimes, strangely, the console disappears and you can make it reappear by going to Window Show View Console. And if you manage to completely screw up your windows in Eclipse, you can go to Window Perspective, Reset Perspective. Those are all good things to know. Um, actually, I should also mention that on the top right here, these are perspectives. Um, so if I click this button, we can open other perspectives. And what a perspective is, is it's just um, a collection of windows that are geared to a particular task. Let's cancel that. And we are using the sort of Java development perspective, and that's what we want for the moment. So uh, working sets, uh, if I look at the Package Explorer, there's a little down arrow just there, View Menu. If I click that, I can go to Select Working Set. And here I'm going to um, I'm going to click New, and I'm going to select Java. Let me make sure that's actually showing on the video here. Click Next, and I'm going to create a working set name called uh, Project Projects One. And I'm going to click the Add All button to say that all the projects that are open should be part of this working set. So a working set, or at least the way I use it, is really nothing but a collection of projects. Let's click Add All and click Finish. Uh, so I'm back on this dialog here. Um, if I click OK, nothing's changed. But let's, let's do that again and create another working set. Let's click the down arrow and go to Select Working Set. And again, I'm going to click New, select Java, click Next, and I'll create another working set called Projects 2. And I won't add any projects to that. I'll just click Finish and click OK. Now I've got two working sets of projects. So if I click the little down arrow another time and click Select Working Set, 
I can select projects two or one or both. So let's try projects one. And that's got all the projects in it because I added all the projects to working set one. If I click the down arrow and go to select working set projects two and untick projects one, then it's blank there. It's sort of cleaned it all up. Let's close that. So my projects are all still there. It's just that they're hidden. So that, that's really useful because if you've got lots of projects open, you can decide which ones show at any given moment. Don't forget, you can also just right click them and close them. But then the, the icon would still be there in that case. So um, this, this just helps you organize your projects. And one last thing that I want to show you quickly, uh, which didn't work so well in the dark theme, unfortunately, it was usable, but only just uh, due to sort of clashes of font colors, is this task list. So I can add tasks for myself here. If I click, um, hopefully I can remember this, new task. Let's try that. And select local and click finish. I get this view coming up, this task view. Uh, let's create a task for myself. So I want to make another video about primitive types video. Let's say that's a task for me to do. I want to make later on and I could select a date when it when it's to be completed um, among other things so here but I won't do that um, you can do it if you want um, and I and this is what I found currently didn't work very well in the dark theme you, you could use it but you couldn't see these numbers unless you clicked on them or any of this so that was quite confusing but I won't use that anyway what I'm going to do is just save that and you can see it's here in the task view um, it's appeared there I can add categories as well so if I click this little down arrow let me get that into the middle by the new icon I can go um, new category I'll create myself a category called videos click OK Maybe I can drag this task into that category. Let's try. Yeah, that worked. Or you can you can select it when you create a new task. You can um, select category if you've created categories. And you can mark tasks as complete. So you can, um, probably one of these buttons does it. I don't usually use this a lot, but let's right click it. We can go mark as complete, and then it gets a line through it. Or we can right click mark as incomplete. So it's quite useful, quite a handy thing. And if you don't like that, you can just get rid of it if you want. You can just click that arrow. It's gone. Get rid of the outline as well if you're not using that. Uh, let's get rid of this task view and go back to the console. Let's maybe open a file. And if you do all of this and then you get confused and you want your default windows back, you can go to window, perspective, reset perspective and it will bring them all back. Okay, we'll leave it there for this video. Try those out for yourself. So we've got working sets and tasks and themes if you're interested in themes. Okay, uh, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, in this video, we're going to take a look at how to terminate our while loops from our program. So in the last video, uh, we saw an example of a non-terminating while loop. So a loop that just keeps going forever, an infinite loop. Uh, in this video, we're going to make it actually terminate. So let's start by here. I've got a new, I've got a new project, which I've called loop conditions. And I'm going to, I'm going to recreate a while loop. So it's worth typing this a few times yourself. So you get into the swing of typing it. Let's write while true open a curly bracket and then make sure the curly brackets closed and let's output a system .out line. hello I'd strongly recommend typing this out several times because it will really help you you've got to sort of memorize these constructs but not by just looking at them and thinking but rather than by by typing them a few times that really helps okay so um, what we'll do here is above the while loop, and it's really important that we do this above the while loop, I'm going to declare an integer variable. I'm going to call it int counter. 
and I'll set it equal to zero to start with. Let's output the counter in our system.out.print line. Um, in fact, uh, let's write in here. Well, let's use print printf just for some practice using it. So here, instead of hello, I'm going to write counter colon just for some text, and then I'm going to put percent %d. And then let's finish it with a backslash n to create a new line after each time this is this runs. So that the first argument is this string with a format specifier in it, percent %d. And after that, I'm going to write comma counter. All right, so if we run that as it is, we're just going to see zero printed over and over again. So let's look. Terminate it with the red button there. So it just says count to zero. But now within the loop, I'm going to go underneath where I wrote system.out.printf and I'm going to say counter and I'm going to ass assign a new value to counter. So I want to use the assignment operator. And the new value is going to be the original value, counter, plus one. So now, every time the loop goes round, it'll give this new value to counter, and the new value will be the original value with one added to it. And that's going to mean that the counter is going to increase one by one. Let's run it. And we can see we've, we've now got huge values very quickly being output here. You might have a lower value if your computer's a bit slower. If you've got an even faster computer than me, you're going to get more numbers being output there, probably. All right. Um, we can use this to terminate our loop. And by the way, this is not the only way we can do this, but uh, for the moment we'll, we'll leave it at this because it's already quite puzzling by itself. Uh, it's, it's not an equation, remember. We're literally saying, okay, take take this value. So it's best really in a way to read it from right to left. So we're saying take counter, whatever the value is, add one to it, and then we're going to assign that, va that value back to the variable counter. So if counter is zero, we add one and we get one. And then we assign the value one. Whoa, didn't mean to do that. We're going to assign the value one to the variable counter. So counter is now one. That's why it's incrementing like that. That's why it's increasing. We can use that to terminate the loop if we change this to while counter less than 10. All right, so this is a less than symbol. And what this is saying is, do the loop while it's true that the value of counter is less than 10. All right, so uh, I'm going to make some more remarks about this in the next video. But for now, just type this out. And even if it's puzzling now, it will gradually start to make sense. But typing is really, you know, it's almost like 90% of the challenge in a way, because you type these and you become familiar. And gradually, I suppose the thing is, it, it's a lot easier to understand a program if it's already in your memory. If you already remember what the program looks like, it becomes a lot easier to understand it than if you're also struggling to remember what different bits it has. And when you type it out, that forces you to pay attention to every single character in the program, and that really helps. So you notice here we've got a semicolon. You could easily forget that easily forget these semicolons, but by typing them over and over again, you just get used to putting them in. You remember that they're there. So typing is typing programs and running them, it's, it's really, really important. So now if we run this, we see in the console, we can actually make this console bigger if I drag it up. We've got counter 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, so we've got 10 iterations in total. So there's 1 to 9, but there's also 0. So we've looped 10 times. And we carried on looping as long as the value of counter was less than 10. So when it was equal to 10, what happened was uh, the program said, okay, while 10, because counter eventually equaled 10, is less than 10, do the loop. And it said, well, it's not true that 10 is less than 10, so I'm not going to run this. So if, when this is true, if, if while finds that this condition is true, so that the counter is less than 10. It will run what's ever in brackets once, and then it goes back to the beginning and checks the condition again. And if it's still true, it runs it again.
Eventually here in this program, it's finding that this condition is not true and then it just does nothing. Then your program carries on to the lines after the while loop. Don't puzzle about that too much. For now, the important thing is type this out and get it working. And if you want a little challenge, try to write a program that outputs, let's say, the word hello or whatever you like exactly five times, no more and no less, exactly five times. Uh, you could also make it output some number. But you, you don't forget, you're going to need this in order to stop the loop. To stop the loop, you need that and you need that. And you also, another place that beginners often go wrong is they put this variable declaration and assignment to zero, that in, initial variable declaration, they put it inside the loop, so inside these curly brackets. And if you do that, counter will always be zero and it will never stop running. You've got to have this outside the loop, you use it in this condition, and very important, um, you increment it, which means increase it basically within this within this block and that's where your system.out is also going or system.out.printf in this case so try that for yourself and then try to create a program that outputs some text exactly five times just for an exercise okay so until next time happy coding hello in this video i just want to go over the this basic while loop a little bit more so I'm going to even, I think, repeat a little bit of what I said in the last video because this is really an important topic. Now, hopefully you've tried out this code. It's, it's really important to do that. And hopefully you've tried the little exercise I gave you to make the loop execute exactly five times instead of ten times in this case or make it execute some particular number of times of your choosing. Um, it... It is only with typing it repeatedly that you will gradually become familiar with it. And yes, we'll, we'll be explaining everything that happens here and you'll gradually come to understand all the, all the individual elements of it much better than you currently do. But even so, it's, it's important to type these things out um, to sort of, that will really help you remember them. And effectively, you've got a sort of recipe here so that if you want a loop that executes a certain number of times, you know what to type and then um, you don't even necessarily have to understand it but eventually certainly you will. Um, so as we've seen uh, we've got this while loop and it's going to execute this code block repeatedly or it, it, it might not execute it at all if the while if the loop condition here is never true this will never get executed but uh, typically we're going to execute it at least once and probably several times. That's the point of a loop. And after the while loop is finished running your code your code block, then whatever statements are below, it's going to carry on, your program will carry on executing those. And we've seen that to actually terminate the loop, we start with a variable declaration and we assign a value to it, typically zero. And then um, usually uh, what we do, or perhaps most often, is we say, run this loop as long as that counter is less than some value. Uh, so if I were to put 5 here, this would execute, this code block would execute exactly 5 times. And um, the reason is that, uh, well, it's the counter starts off at 0, and then this would be true for the values uh, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Remember, we're incrementing the counter increasing the value of it every time we go through the loop. When counter is equal to 5, it would stop. This is a little bit confusing because we're saying while counter is less than 5, and, and yet um, somehow the loop executes exactly 5 times. And the reason is that we start at 0. So uh, we, it executes for the value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, instead of, as you might expect, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, so that's that's just a little bit confusing, but basically if you want a loop that executes, you know, 63 times, you'd put 63 here. So it's pretty simple. It's really important to type out this, even a few times if you can be bothered. Try to type it from memory or by looking um, at the code as little as possible uh, until you can uh, actually write a loop 
uh, yourself. That's a, that's a good thing to do if you feel like looking it, looking at it, doing it. I should say because um, uh, as I've mentioned, a lot of learning just occurs with sort of almost like muscle memory. Just by typing it again, you've got a little little recipe here for how to execute a loop a certain number of times. And I know at this point, if you're new to programming, you're going to probably still feel a bit confused. Uh, quite possibly, if you don't, that's great. But it will be normal to still feel confused. We're going to be looking at all the different elements of this loop in more detail and in other contexts, so you'll become familiar with them. But even if you do feel confused, uh, by sort of learning this as a little recipe, then um, you've got something you can use and then you can improve your understanding of it as time goes by. Okay, uh, so one important element of this is that we must increment, or in other words, increase the counter as we go through the loop. Otherwise, it, otherwise this will never be, this condition will never be false uh, and the loop will go on forever. We have to remember to increment it. Increment just means increase, usually by one. And there's also decrement, which means decrease by one, and we're going to be looking at those. In this case, so we've got this expression which, as I've noted previously, um, can confuse beginners because it looks a bit like a mathematical equation expressing equality. It looks like it's saying counter is equal to itself plus one. That's not what it means at all. It's really important to realize that in uh, Java and a number of other programming languages, a single equal sign doesn't express equality. It expresses assignment. It's the assignment operator. And with the assignment operator, it's, it's typically best to look at the right-hand side first and work out what that is going to amount to. And then uh, that's going to get assigned to whatever variable is on the left-hand side. So in this case, we take the variable of counter, whatever it happens to be at that moment, we add one to it, and then we assign it or we store that value in this variable on the left-hand side, which also happens to be counter, but that doesn't cause any problems. So it's like we're taking a value of counter, adding one to it, uh, um, and but that doesn't actually change counter. This bit doesn't change counter. You just you're just using the value of counter and adding one to that, and that's kind of stored in the computer's memory temporarily. It's it's this assignment that actually takes that new value counter plus one, and then stores it back in counter. If you are still confused, don't worry. That's normal. Uh, your confusion will gradually clear up. I One thing I noticed was that there's a, um, with Eclipse, uh, I've been using um, working sets, which um, I, don't, I don't use that much, to be honest, but I thought it would make things less confusing here. When I create a new project, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to automatically add it to the working set. I think that's a little Eclipse bug. Maybe it won't happen in your version, you know, because when I go to new Java project, there's an option there to add project to working sets. And the one that I'm using is selected by default. But even so, I'm finding that my project ends up invisible. Uh, to see it, I can click this little down arrow, go to window working sets, and I see all projects. Uh, and uh, if I don't do that, if I just stay on the working set I'm in, what, I f what I'm finding I have to do is click the down arrow, go to, um, uh, let's see, yeah, go to edit active working set. And then I can see the project I've created and I can add it to my existing working set, the one I'm using at the moment, the active one. Uh, so you, you hopefully won't have that Eclipse bug, but if you do, if, you, if you're creating projects and they don't appear, click the down arrow and go to edit working set and just add it with the add button here. Okay, we'll leave it there for this video. And what we're going to do in the next video is look at various ways of incrementing variables because it's such an important topic. We're going to be using it over and over again. And um, gradually I'm going to introduce you to things like operator precedents, but sort of bit by bit. This is a complicated topic. And pretty soon we're going to get on to looking at other fundamental building blocks of computer programs like the if construct and uh, other types of loop, this sort of thing. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. 
Hello, in this video we're going to look at various different ways of incrementing and decrementing variables. So we've seen that in our video on while loops uh, that we had to increment a variable and that's such an important thing to do and there are various ways to do it. So we're going to look at some of them here and that's going to sort of, although it might not seem very important now, we're going to find that this is going to be quite enlightening as we progress through the course. So uh, let's start off with a variable here. I'm going to make it of type int and I'm going to, let's call it just um, count and set it equal to zero. So what we did to incre increment our variable for our while loop was we wrote this, something like this, count plus, count, sorry, count equals count plus one. And we've, we've already gone over that, so I won't go over it again. Um, and then if we output it, then, okay, it started at zero, and so it's going to be one now. And if we just run that, that we can see the value one in the console. Of course, if I started it at something else, like 11, and I increment it, it will be 12. So there's no great mysteries there. Nothing special about zero here. Now, there are various other ways we can do that. So um, one way is we can, um, we can use the same operator that we previously used with strings plus equals. So I could say here, let's increment it further. So I could say here, count plus equals one, and then we'll output it. So what we're doing here is um, we start off with count at zero, and then we're, we're adding one to it by the most basic kind of simple method, we're outputting it and then we're adding one to it by another method and outputting it again. So we expect to see one and two in the console. Now what this does is plus equals is exactly equivalent to count equals count plus one. It's equivalent to that. It's like a sort of synonym for it. Uh, the plus equals operator takes the existing value of a variable and add something to it, or it, it kind of looks like it does that at least with with strings. Um, uh, with strings, you use it to concatenate more text to an existing string, basically. Uh, and in fact, um, with strings, what you're really doing is creating a completely new string and create and assigning the original string reference to refer to a new string. That, that's not important. We'll leave that aside for now, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're taking count and we're adding one to its existing value using plus equals. And we'll just run that. Let's run it. So uh, we've got one and two uh, coming out in the console there. So let's increment it by yet another uh, way of incrementing variables. Let's do count plus plus semicolon. So this is, um, is the, well, it's the increment operator. Um, it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's some subtleties to this, but I'm going to leave them aside just for this minute. Let's just output this already. So that does it, it, it in this case, it does the same thing as these other statements that we've got. It's just going to in, increase the value of count by one. So now with, with these statements here, you don't have to increase the value of count by one. You could increase it by anything you like. We're just specifying one here as it happens. In this case, it specifically increases the values of integers by one. So you can't use it to increase them by 10 or something. It's, it's, it is going to be one. So what we expect now is to see that after we've done that, and we've, if we print it out again, its value will now, at this point in the program, it will be three. So if we run this, we see it's three. So we've got one, two, three. Another thing we can do is this, plus plus count. And don't forget the semicolon, of course, as usual. And if we output that, this does almost the same thing as this. So if we run it, uh, indeed it's increased the value of count to four. Now this is called the 
postfix version of this operator. Postfix meaning after, you know, it's, it's kind of fixed on after the variable. This is the prefix version. Prefix meaning, well, a prefix, you know, it's fixed in place before the variable. Uh, there is a difference between these, this and this, but we won't look at it in this video. Um, we'll talk about it in another video. So we, we see here that there are four different ways um, that spring to my mind, at least, that we could in increase or increment the value of this of a, of a variable, of an integer variable. First way is this, count equals count plus one. We can also do count plus equals one or count plus equals whatever other number we want. Uh, and then we can use a postfix increment operator, count plus plus, or we could use a prefix increment operator, plus plus count. Um, so I would suggest trying those out, but actually, uh, before you do that, let's look at decrementing the variable as well. So I can do the same thing in reverse. Uh, for every increment operator, there's a kind of, well, for every way of incrementing this, there's also a way of decrementing it. So if I say count equals count minus one, that's going to, that's going to take the value of count, subtract one from that value, and at the moment, we're, we're then holding that new value temporarily in memory and then assign that new value to the original variable. So this has the effect of subtracting one from the value of count. I'm, I'm giving you explanations here, but that is to try to hopefully you'll understand bits of my explanations at least. But the real learning will take place when you type this out and try it and even experiment with it. So if we now run this, then we get one, two, three, four, and then we decremented it and we got down to three again. We can also uh, decrement using this kind of a technique. So instead of plus equals, we can do minus equals. Let's do count minus equals one and sys out. Let's run this. So now it's down to two. Uh, so this, this is precisely equivalent to this. Let's just format that to get rid of that blank line. Well, that doesn't work. Oh, yeah, it does. Okay. So this and this mean exactly the same thing. We can also do count negative negative or count minus minus. Uh, so that's the postfix decrement operator. And that works just fine. So if we run this now, it's down to one. And finally, we can do a prefix decrement operator. We could do this, count minus minus count. We could have used any of these methods in our for loop, in our while loop, sorry. Uh, well, any of the methods that increment it, at least. So let's run this. And we get, finally, we, we get down to zero, which is what it was to start with. And to make that clearer, actually, after I initially... Uh, assign the value zero to count. Let's put an initial sysout in there. So it starts off at zero. We increment it one, two, three, four, and then we're decrementing it by various methods, three, two, one, zero. Now, what I'd suggest is that you type all of these yourself, um, either one after the other, or just try them. Just create a program, increment a variable in it like this, run it, check that it works, and then change that to this. So get this to work. Once you've tried them all out, try to write this program um, from memory. That is, start with a variable that has some value, for example, zero, and then increment it by each of the four different methods, and then outputting it every time afterwards, and then decrement it by each of the four methods, outputting it every time. Um, if you can be bothered to do that, that'll help fix all these different operators in your mind. And then uh, you'll, you'll feel more confident when we actually start using them. So in other words, try to replicate this program from memory. But I'll probably suggest, unless you're feeling confident, that you try each of them out individually before you try to do it all without referring back to this code. Have a go at it and see how far you get.
Okay, so until next time, happy coding. <laughs>